Lesson 1 What is Political Theory? The ideas of economists and political philosophers, both when they are right and when they are wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed the world is ruled by little else. The power of vested interests is vastly exaggerated compared with the gradual encroachment of ideas. It is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous gains. So long as rational curiosity exists, a desire for justification and explanation in terms of motives and reasons, and not only of causes or functional correlations or statistical probabilities, political theory will not wholly perish from the earth, however many of its rivals, such as sociology, philosophical analysis, social psychology, political science, economics, jurisprudence, semantics, may claim to have dispelled its imaginary realm, Berlin. The object of science is to show things happen, and why, in the nexus of cause and effect, they do happen. What I mean is simply that it is not the function of science to pass ethical judgment. The political theorist, on the other hand, is essentially concerned with the discussion of what ought to be. His judgments are at bottom value judgments. Political theory is a personal endeavor to understand and experience the present political reality and also to evolve a mechanism in order to transcend the present imperfect society leading to perfection and a more just order. This includes a study of the evolution, nature, composition, need and purpose of the governmental apparatus, and also an understanding of human perception and nature, and its relationship with the larger community. The golden age of political theory is from Plato, 428 27 to 347 BC, to George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, AD 1770 to 1831. Political theory is one of the core areas in political science. It is only recently that political theory has emerged as an academic discipline. Prior to this, those engaged in the enterprise styled themselves as philosophers or scientists. A distinction is made between political theory and political philosophy, political theory and political science. This differentiation arose because of the rise of modern science, which brought about a general shift in intellectual perceptions. Political science tries to provide plausible generalizations and laws about politics and political behavior. Political theory reflects upon political phenomenon and actual political behavior by subjecting them to philosophical or ethical criteria. It considers the question of the best political order, which is part of a larger and a more fundamental question, namely the ideal form of life that an individual should lead within a larger community. No political theory eulogizes a Robinson Crusoe. In the process of answering immediate and local questions, it addresses perennial issues, which is why a study of the great books is imperative. These books contain the quintessence of eternal knowledge, and are an inheritance not of any one culture, place, people or time, but of entire humankind. Political theory is the most appropriate term to employ in designating that intellectual tradition which affirms the possibility of transcending the sphere of immediate practical concerns and viewing man's societal existence from a critical perspective. There is no tension between political theory and political science, for they differ in terms of their boundaries and jurisdiction, but not in their aim. Political theory supplies ideas, concepts and theories for purpose of analysis, description, explanation and criticism, which in turn are incorporated in political science. Political theory was political science in the full sense, and there could be no science without theory. Just as we may speak of theory as either the activity of theorizing or the recorded results of the theorizing, so political theory may legitimately and accurately be used as synonymous with political science. Some commentators distinguish between the terms political theory, political thought, political philosophy and political ideology though many treat these terms interchangeably. Political philosophy provides general answers to general questions to concepts and theories such as justice, right, the distinction between as and ought, and the larger issues of politics. Political philosophy is part of normative political theory, for it attempts to establish the interrelationships between concepts. It would not be wrong to say that every political philosopher is a theorist, though not every political theorist is a political philosopher. Political philosophy is a complex activity which is best understood by analyzing the many ways that the acknowledged masters have practiced it. No single philosopher and no one historical age can be said to have defined it conclusively, any more than any one painter or school of painting has practiced all that we mean by painting. There is an intimate and ongoing relationship between political philosophy and philosophy. The credit for it goes to Plato for whom the good of the individual was inextricably linked with that of the community. Subsequent well-known philosophers have contributed generously to the main stock of our political ideas, but they have given the political theorist many of his methods of analysis and criteria of judgment, Wallenibert too. The difference between philosophy and political philosophy is not with regard to method or mood, it relates to the subject matter. While philosophy attempts to understand, as Wallen says, truths publicly arrived at and publicly demonstrable, Wallen Ibert, 4, political theorists try to explain the meaning of political and its relationship with the public sphere. Political theorists since Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, have tried to find answer to what constitutes the political, rather than being interested in political practices or their applications. When Aristotle argued that an individual needs, and can find fulfillment only through, a political community, he was emphasizing on the commonness of the political space, that political rulers. 
concerned with those general interests shared by all the members of the community, that political authority is distinguished from other forms of authority in that it speaks in the name of a society considered in its common quality, that membership in a political society is a token of a life of common involvements, and that the order that political authority presides over is one that should extend throughout the length and breadth of society as a whole. This view has been reiterated in recent times by Hannah Arendt, 1906-1975 and Michael Joseph Okeshott, 1901-1990. They saw political life as a distinctive form of human organization with special value, a place for freedom, honor and full human development. They were concerned with the autonomy of the political, safeguarding it particularly from the onslaughts of social and economic issues. Remarkably similar to this view was that of Easton, for whom politics meant an authoritative allocation of values. The subject matter of political theory was linked to a quest for a proper and legitimate form and scope of politics as a practical activity. Equally important is the demarcation between the public sphere and personal space. While it has been traditionally contended that political theory is about the public domain, recent writings by feminists have questioned this focus. The issue was on the agenda ever since Mary Wollstonecraft, 1759-1797, followed by John Stuart Mill, 1806-1873, spoke of subjugation in the private domain, insular to the ideas of freedom, equality and justice that dominate the public sphere. But it has not been until recently that debates about this form of slavery, and its entwinement with the public and the private have touched the center of political theory. Indeed, recent debates have been broadened to include questions about the patriarchal construction of the central categories of political thought, the political meaning of sexual difference, the relation between the intimate, familial and domestic, and the economy and state, and the interconnections among nature, reason, politics and the sexes. Traditionally, a political theorist understood and analyzed the political as implying the limits of state action. The idea of the modern state, sovereign internally and externally, with supreme jurisdiction over its territorial space was the subject matter of normative political theory and of political analysis in social sciences. However, with globalization brought about by a global economy, transportation and communication, development of intergovernmental and quasi-supranational institutions, regional and international organizations, and growth of complex intricate interrelationships between states and societies, the fate and future of the nation-state is increasingly becoming a focus of inquiry. The fact is that, issues like religion, or prices, or race are not by nature a priori either political or non-political. They are made or become political in certain times and places. And that means, in those times and places they are lifted out of unplanned drift and placed on the political agenda as conscious collective concerns. Political thought is the thought of the whole community. This includes the writings and speeches of the articulate sections, like professional politicians, political commentators, social reformers and ordinary persons of a community. Thought can be in the form of political treatises, scholarly articles, speeches, government policies and decisions, and poems and prose that express the anguish of people. Thought is time-bound. In short, political thought includes theories that attempt to explain political behavior, values to evaluate it and methods to control it. One notable example of inclusion of the normative perspective in a political document is the American Declaration of Independence, 1776, which spoke of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Similarly, the preamble to the Constitution of India has been considered by Barker as the best possible articulation of a collective desire of an entire nation. Political theory, unlike thought, refers to the speculation by a single individual usually articulated in treatises as models of explanation. It consists of the theories of institutions, including those of the state, of law, of representation and of election. The mode of inquiry is comparative and explanatory. Political theory attempts to explain the attitudes and actions arising from ordinary political life and to generalize about them in a particular context, thus political theory is concerned about with the relationships between concepts and circumstances. Political philosophy attempts to resolve or to understand conflicts between political theories which might appear equally acceptable in given circumstances. Political ideology is a systematic and all-embracing doctrine which attempts to give a complete and universally applicable theory of human nature and society, with a detailed program of attaining it. John Locke, 1632-1704, has often been described as the father of modern ideologies. Marxism is a classic example of an ideology summed up in the statement that the purpose of philosophy is to change and not merely interpret the world. All political ideology is political philosophy though the reverse is not true. The 20th century has seen many ideologies like fascism, Nazism, communism and liberalism. A distinctive trait of political ideology is its dogmatism which, unlike political philosophy, precludes and discourages critical appraisal because of its aim of realizing the perfect society. Political ideology, according to Germano and Sabina, is a negation of political theory. An ideology is of recent origin, and under the influence of positivism, is based on subjective, unverifiable value preferences. Germano distinguishes between a political theorist and a publicist in that while the former has a profound understanding of issues, the latter is concerned with the immediate questions. By this distinction, Germano considers Aristotle, Street. 
Thomas Aquinas 1224-1274, Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469-1527, Thomas Hobbes, 1588-1679, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, 1712-1778, and Hegel as theorists, but their contemporaries Feliz, Giles, Botero, Filmer, Condorcet and the Mastery as publicists. The gap between a theorist and a publicist is wide and divergent, differing, fundamentally in orientation, scope, emphasis, tone and terminological sophistication, Germano 1967-14. In this context, Germano rejects Mannheim's thesis of sociology of knowledge, which contended that belief structures have a social origin, and that social science knowledge is dependent on the class origin of a theorist, thereby precluding objectivity. While the data offered by the sociology of knowledge are of obvious relevance in explaining the thinking of some propagandists for mass movements, they are of scant significance in helping us understand a Plato or Hegel. Furthermore, Germano, like Plato, also distinguishes between mere opinion and knowledge, the latter being the starting point of a political theorist. Every political theorist plays a dual role, that of a scientist and a philosopher. The way he would delineate the roles would depend on one's temperament and interests. Only by combining the two roles can he make worthwhile contributions to human knowledge. The scientific component of a theory can appear coherent and significant if the author has a preconceived notion of the aims of political life. The philosophical basis is revealed in the manner in which reality is depicted. Political theory is dispassionate and disinterested. As science it will describe political reality without trying to pass judgment on what is being depicted either implicitly or explicitly. As philosophy, it will prescribe rules of conduct which will secure the good life for all of society and not simply for certain individuals or classes. The theorist, in theory, will not himself have a personal interest in the political arrangements of any one country or class or party. Devoid of such an interest, his vision of reality and his image of the good life will not be clouded, nor will his theory be special pleading. The intention of ideology is to justify a particular system of power in society. The ideologue is an interested party, his interest may be to defend things as they are, or to criticize the status quo in the hope that a new distribution of power will come into being. Rather than disinterested prescription we have rationalization. Rather than dispassionate description we have a distorted picture of reality. Political theory is the history of political thought. Courses in political theory normally offer detailed and elaborate study of books or particular political philosophies from Plato to contemporary times, from a historical perspective. These books are studied for their normative statements about the desirability of certain types of institutions, governments and laws, which are generally accompanied by rational arguments. The classics are portrayed as timeless in quality, permanent in relevance and universal in their significance. The classical tradition demonstrates a great deal of unity in style and manner of argument, which is why it constitutes a common school of inquiry. However, in spite of this intrinsic unity, the classics offer divergent interpretations of politics, and this makes their study useful for understanding contemporary politics. Political theory is technique of analysis. When Aristotle remarked that the individual is a political animal, he indicated the primacy of politics and the fact that political thinking takes place at various levels and in a variety of ways. The political, in such a view, became not only all-pervasive, but also the highest kind of activity. Politics symbolizes a collective public life, wherein people create institutions that regulate their common life. It also denotes the importance of political activity, which was described by the famous Italian Marxist, Antonio Gramsci, 1891-1937, as an activity par excellence. Common sense questions and political opinions merit an answer, for instance, are individuals equal? Should the state be more important than the individual? How does one justify violence employed by the state? Is there an inherent tension between freedom and equality? Is the minority justified in dictating terms to the majority and vice versa? Our responses to these statements often reflect what ought to be the case, rather than what is the case. At stake here is a choice between values and ideals. By exercising one's preferences, one also, unknowingly, subscribes to a political ideology which means that answers to questions will vary not only according to individual opinion, but also depending on one's value preferences. It is because of this basic reason that political theory has to be a part of an open society for amongst us there would always be liberals and conservatives. Training in political theory helps us to answer the aforesaid questions logically, speculatively and critically. Political theory is, quite simply, man's attempts to consciously understand and solve the problems of his group life and organization. It is the disciplined investigation of political problems. Not only to show what a political practice is, but also to show what it means. In showing what a practice means, or what it ought to mean, political theory can alter what it is. Political theory had been used to either defend or question the status quo. Taking into cognizance the facts and details, it explains and describes politics in abstract and general terms that allow space for critical imagination. As a discipline, political theory aims to describe, explain, justify or criticize the existing institutional arrangements and power equations in society. 
Some commentators like Goodwin, 1993, 265 to 266, emphasize the centrality of the power paradigm, whereas others like Talcott Parsons, 1902 to 1979, downgrade it, comparing it to money in modern societies. Recent important works by John Rawls, 1921-2002, and Robert Nozick, 1924-2002, do not emphasize power at all. It is interesting that Rawls emphasizes a well-ordered society, identifying justice, stability and efficiency as its main ingredients, without any attempt to speak about the distribution of power. Political theory is conceptual clarification. Political theory helps to understand the concepts and terms used in a political argument and analysis. For instance, the meaning of freedom, equality, democracy, justice, rights, etc. These terms are frequently used not only in daily conversation, but also in discourse of political theory. An understanding of these terms is important for it helps us to know the way they have been employed, distinguish between their definitions and their usage in a structure of argument. Many, like Weldon, 1953, stress the need to scrutinize concepts in ordinary pre-theoretical language. An analysis of concepts also reveals the ideological commitment of a speaker or, and writer. A liberal defines freedom as implying choice and absence of restraints, while a socialist links freedom with equality. A liberal defines a state as an instrument of human welfare, while for a socialist a state is an instrument of oppression, domination and class privileges. Conceptual clarification is definitely possible but cannot be neutral. Those engaged in it overtly or covertly subscribe to value preference, and in this sense their task is not different from the authors of classics and political theory. Political theory is formal model building. This perception, particularly popular in the United States, looks to political theory as an exercise in devising formal models of political processes, similar to the ones in theoretical economics. These models serve two purposes. First, they are explanatory, offering systematically the factors on which political processes are based. Second, they are normative, for they try to show the consequences that would accrue from following a certain rule. A good example of such an exercise is Anthony Downs, 1957, theory of electoral competition which viewed the voters as trying to gain maximum utility from an election result and parties as teams trying to maximize their probability of winning. Downs then showed how parties, in order to win, devise ideological stances. Another important model is Kenneth Arrow's, 1963, impossibility theorem, which stated that, among other things, where a democratic choice had to be made between more than two alternatives, the outcome would very likely be arbitrary, influenced by the procedure employed to exercise the choice. Joseph Schumpeter's, 1976, elitist theory of democracy was based on the assumption that a human being takes his economic life more seriously than the political one. Political theory is theoretical political science. The emergence of political science in the 20th century has led some political scientists to look upon political theory as a mere theoretical branch of the discipline. An attempt is made to integrate empirical observations with a systematic explanation of one's everyday experiences in the world. This view dispenses with the normative content of traditional political theory. Though mere explanation of political phenomena is possible, grounding it in empiricism would not be adequate. Any attempt to formulate a political theory free of normative elements would inherently fail. This is because any explanation of political events would mean an interpretation of the intentions and motives of the participants, and such an interpretation would bring forth normative issues. Changing context of words and its implication for political theory. Like ideas even words are to be contextualized. This proposition, Raymond Williams, 1958, defends by contextualizing five words in the English language, i.e. industry, democracy, class, art and culture. In the context of these words the last few decades of the 18th century and the first 50 years of the 19th century is of crucial significance. All these words which were a part of the English vocabulary were used for a long time but acquired a new and significant meaning at this aforesaid period. Williams argues that this change in words can be described some kind of a map which reflects a larger change in life and thought and the subsequent changes in language itself. With drastic changes in the life itself in all its significant manifestations, social, political and economic, and the altered relationships of institutions and activities led to this sea change in the meaning and contextualization of words. In the context of the Industrial Revolution, the word industry which was associated with particular human character meaning individual attributes became a description of a collective word for manufacturing and productive process. The earlier use continues even today but ever since Smith changed the context of the word industry the latter use is more common. Democracy which had a Greek origin, meaning government by the people, came into the English language at the time of the American and French revolutions as it was not until the French Revolution that democracy ceased to be a mere literary word and became part of the political vocabulary, Ibid, 14. The present use of the term democracy till the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, was equated with mob rule and was supposed to be both dangerous and subversive. But the connotation totally changes with the struggle, as expressed by Williams, as democratic representation. The word class in the modern sense begins around 1740.
Before this time, class had a connotation of describing division of a group in school and college taken from logic and philosophy. But towards the end of the 18th century, class in the modern social sense came into use with expressions like higher class, middle class and a middling class. The phrase working class comes into use around 1815 and upper class in 1820s. The important phrases like class prejudices, class legislation, class consciousness, class conflict and class war followed this early trend and the phrase upper middle class was first used in the 1890s and the lower middle class only in the 20th century. Art also reflected this process of change. Originally it meant an individual skill but subsequently it came to refer to an institution meaning activities of a certain kind, Ibit, 15. Earlier art was any kind of human skill but in the new context it meant a specialized category of imaginative or creative arts. Similarly culture which was understood as tending of natural growth, changed to something which is doing in itself, i.e. a general state or habit of the mind linked to human perfection, intellectual development within the entirety of society within a larger framework of general category of arts, Ibit, 15. Later it encompassed the entirety of all arts and culture came to mean the whole society including the material, the intellectual and the spiritual. Williams considers this changing connotation of culture is of striking importance as the change reflects the change in the other key words of industry, democracy and class. The importance for political theory in this changed contextualization is twofold, at the changes in society connotes total alteration in the meaning of some key words and b, the change reflects the new personal and social relationships that inevitability came out of the significant changes in this period of quick change. This means that the new idea of culture not only came as a response to the new industrial society but also to a new social and political phenomenon called democracy. Apart from this total transformation of older words a lot of new words emerged to describe the new situation like ideology, intellectual, rationalism, scientist, humanitarian, utilitarian, romanticism, atomistic, bureaucracy, capitalism, collectivism, commercialism, communism, doctrinaire, equalitarian, liberalism, masses, medieval, medievalism, primitivism, proletariat, socialism, unemployment, cranks, highbrow, ISMS and pretensions. Key theoretical concepts in political theory. A reader getting introduced to political theory for the first time may think it's sufficient to study the institutions rather than abstract concepts, in order to understand the character and nature of society. While a study of institutions is possible, one realizes that institutional arrangements vary from society to society because they are based on divergent sets of ideas. This realization takes us to the heart of the matter as to what is more important, reality or ideas, fact or concept. Do ideas reflect reality, or is reality based on ideas? It may be difficult to find satisfactory answers to these perennial questions that would satisfy everybody. However, in trying to define them, one comes across categorizations and labels that become useful tools in analysis. For instance, an idealist like Plato would contend that there exist some permanent immutable ideas to which reality should approximate. On the contrary, there are those like Locke, who believe that concepts are derived from our observation of the material reality, and are called materialist or realist. Usually, though not always, a materialist approach is empirical and inductive in nature. An inductive method of reasoning means that general statements are derived from observing particular facts. It is the opposite of the deductive form of reasoning, in which the conclusion of an argument is validly inferred from some premises. A descriptive theory is one that describes reality and constructs explanations on the facts collected. In contrast, an evaluative theory analyzes ideas with reference to other concepts and values. The opposition between descriptive and evaluative theory is reflected in a distinction made between facts and values. Facts are empirically verifiable, while values are not as they cannot be substantiated. Deontology is ethical theory which considers certain moral duties as self-evident and absolutely binding, irrespective of the consequences. As opposed to this is teleology or consequemialism, which believes that the rightness or wrongness of actions is determined by their good or bad consequences. It also holds that events can be explained, and evaluation is possible only by considering the ends towards which they are directed. The Kantian, and in recent times, Rawlsian theory, is deontological. Classical utilitarianism is teleological. An important distinction is made between normative and empirical theory. A normative political theory is prescriptive, for it sets standards or forms of conduct and does not describe facts or events. Normative statements include words like ought, should and must. An empirical social scientist would observe reality and experience, and then construct a general theory based on a plethora of facts and data. It does not accept a priori knowledge. Closely related to empiricism is pragmatism, a philosophical theory associated with the American philosophers C.S. P.S. 1839-1914, William James 1842-1910, and John Dewey 1859-1952, which holds that beliefs have a meaning and justification because of their practical results. It also accepts the fact that the subject of knowledge is not merely a recipient of sensation, but also an active inquirer. Some see experience as intelligible in isolation, without any reference to the nature of its object, or to the circumstances of its subject. This implies that there is no need to explain the social condition of an experience. 
Such a view was implied in David Hume's 1711-1776 theory of the relation between idea and impression and Bertrand Arthur William Russell's 1872-1970 logical atomism. Experience and fulfillment of desires as the basis of human nature is articulated by utilitarianism, which judges human actions in terms of the pleasures promoted, increased and the pain caused, decreased. As opposed to empiricism, rationalism contends that the world can be known through the power of reason, and reason can correct experiences delivered by the senses. Rationalism had its origins in Plato, but it is popularly associated with modern theorists beginning with René Descartes, 1596-1650, culminating in the German academic philosophy of the Enlightenment. The exponents of rationalism were Baruch, or Benedict, Spinoza, 1632-1677, and Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, 1646-1716. Rationalism was criticized by Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, but re-emerged in the writings of Hegel. Max Weber, 1864-1920, understood rationalism in the sense of preferred legal rational authority over others, traditional and charismatic. Rationalism used by J.S. Mill meant search for rational solutions other than prejudices, and scientific explanations other than mysticism. It also means favoring clear and explicit solutions based on principles. Rationalism has been regarded as a political vice by theorists like Okeshot, who pointed out that a rationalist mind is skeptical of any authority other than reason, dismissing tradition, custom, habit and group experience as irrelevant. A distinction is also made between subjective or personal, individual and objective or impersonal, impartial. Rousseau spoke of the general will promoting objective good of the community. Another term, relativism, connotes that values and principles do not have universal or timeless validity and that there is no absolute criterion of truth. Values are valid within a social group or an individual person or an age. It is commonly associated with historicism, which has two meanings. In the late 19th century it meant uniqueness of all historical phenomena, and that each age should be interpreted in terms of its own ideas and principles. The second meaning, associated with Sir Karl Popper, 1902-1994, means belief in large-scale laws of historical development on the basis of which predictions could be made. Intellectual influences responsible for the decline of political theory. Since the time of Hegel, political theory faced its challenge of ideology and positivism. When Karl Heinrich Marx, 1818-1883, proclaimed that his intention was not to interpret to the world but to change it, he obliterated the distinction between theory and practice. He produced an anti-theory, offering to humankind the most radical form of messianic and ideological thinking, Germano 1967-57. For Marx, reality had to be comprehended in practical productive activity. Theory lost its critical dimension, for it was described as the tool of the privileged class. This makes Marx an ideologist, and not a political theorist. Ideology, as defined by Antonio Luis Claude Graf Tested de Tracy, 1754-1836, meant the science of deciphering the origin of ideas. He held that all thoughts were reflected and determined by sense experience, as the world of sensation is the only reality. He also pointed out that a truly scientific study of human beings would help in exposing illusions and abstractions which had no roots in reality. All forms of abstract thought, including religion and philosophy, had to be discarded. He rejected all kinds of critical inquiry. Positivism. The positivization of the social sciences mainly came out of the tremendous influences of Isidore Auguste Marie Francois Comte, 1798-1857, who has been regarded as the father of positivism. Determined to formulate a new master science of human beings which he described as sociology, he asserted that only sense experience was real. Metaphysical, ethical and theological theories had no use. Positivism emphasized precision, constructive power and relativism. In this context, political theory did not convey any meaning. Positivism contends that analytical statements about the physical or social world fall into three categories. First, such statements can be useful tautologies, meaning repeating the same things through different words, and purely definitional statements that give specific meaning to a particular concept or phenomenon. Second, statements are to be empirically tested by observation to assess their truth or falsity. Third, statements that did not fall into the aforesaid categories and lacked analytic content had to be dropped. In short, the positivists understood meaningful analysis as possible only through useful tautologies and empirical statements. This precluded metaphysics, theology, aesthetics and ethics, for they merely introduced obscurity into the process of inquiry. Positivism aimed to be value-free, or ethically neutral, patterning itself on the natural sciences in deciding about the right and wrong of issues. Empiricism believed that observation and experience as sources of knowledge were central to the many shades of positivism. Comte integrated this assumption with two more ideas. First, he reviewed the development of the sciences with a view to ascertaining the thesis of unity among the sciences, natural and social, whereby they could be integrated into a single system of knowledge. Second, with the idea of a unified science, he founded sociology in the belief that scientific knowledge offered the requisite clues for control over both nature and society. 
With the help of these three tools of analysis, empiricism, unity of science and control, positivism in the 19th century focused itself on society in general, in the hope of overcoming the existing malaise and realizing a better future. Logical Positivism A revitalized form of positivism appeared in the form of logical positivism, espoused by the Vienna Circle consisting of mathematicians, philosophers and scientists in the 1920s and 1930s. Members of this group included Moritz Klick 1882-1936, Rudolf Carnap 1891-1970, Otto von Murat 1882-1945, Victor Kraft and Herbert Fagel 1902-1988. Those who were associated with it were Ludwig Wittgenstein 1889-1951, Hans Kelsen 1881-1973, and Popper. Wittgenstein provided an intellectual link between the circle and the school of linguistic philosophy that thrived in Oxford and other English universities in the 20s and 30s of this century. Logical positivists reject traditional metaphysics' cognitive status. For them, scientific propositions are of two kinds, analytic or synthetic. An analytic statement is logical or mathematical in nature. It is synthetic when a proposition adds something to the meaning of a given term. Verifiability is the criterion for synthetic or substantive and factual statements suggesting that a synthetic statement had meaning only if it was capable of empirical verification. Lack of empirical verification means that a statement cannot be proved to be true or false, and so is meaningless. From the standpoint, traditional political theory is rejected as unverifiable and meaningless. Logical positivists espouse a more radical form of empiricism, phenomenalism, restricting experience of sensations as the basis of science. They insist on logical analysis and aim to unify the sciences on the premise that experience supplied the subject of all science, and logic the formal language to link descriptions of experiences and formulate laws and theories. The impact of logical positivism on political thought was twofold. First, by its principle of verification, it viewed politics as metaphysical, beyond science, essentially non-rational and arbitrary. Science, on the contrary, would instruct us as to what would happen rather than what should happen. This distinguished them from the positivists who attempted to make politics scientific. Second, to be scientific meant adopting those aspects of science that logical positivism identified as science. It considered physics as a paradigm of a unified science and that science proceeds inductively from observations to laws. Popper's Method an amendment to the principle of verification was suggested by Popper with his principle of falsification, which he used to solve the problem of induction, popular ever since Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, invented it, known as Hume's problem. Popper's seminal achievement was to work out a reasonable solution to the problem of induction, McGee 1984. Hame was the first to raise doubts about the inductive method. He convincingly argued that no number of singular observations, however large and foolproof, could really lead to a scientifically satisfactory general statement. For instance, if one particular A was exactly the same as another B, it was not logically defensible that all A's would be B's. Even if a very large sample was taken to arrive at a definite conclusion, it would merely remain a psychological fact and not a logical one. This was true of predictions as well, as past experience did not imply that the same would continue to happen in future. It was an inherent limitation of observation, as it was not possible to observe future events. The propensity to accept the validity of the inductive method emerged more from a psychological conditioning rather than from logic. Hame concluded that non-scientific law really had a rationally secure foundation. Following Hame, Popper rejected the traditional view of science and replaced it with another, by pointing out the logical asymmetry between verification and falsification. This meant that no number of cases of A that brought B could really establish that all as were Bs. Such universal notions were unprovable and disprovable. By the principle of falsification, a theory continued to hold until it was falsified, and therefore falsification, and not verification, was the most suitable method for scientific inquiry. All knowledge was provisional, based on hypotheses. Such formulations had to be continuously scrutinized by negative instances of falsification. Knowledge developed in a process of conjectures and refutations open to searching and uncompromising tests. Arguments were always tentative and could be criticized for their validity. The basis of falsification was common sense realism and indeterminism, essential for proper functioning of a critical method. Theory formulation was rigorous in Popper's method, as it had to withstand refutation. Refutation of existing knowledge led to the emergence of new problems, and possibly a subsequent solution which advanced knowledge. The challenge was to go beyond the existing evidence that enabled one to face a new situation. The implication for this was that a theory, whether true or false, would lead to more accumulation of knowledge by new discoveries and inventions, and thus result in better theories. Scientific discoveries were mostly accidental. All knowledge was incomplete and provisional. What is considered to be the truth today may be falsified tomorrow. But the new paradigm could also be provisional and might be refuted again, and because of this no theory could claim finality. At best, it could claim that it was better than the preceding theory. Science as a body of well-established facts was incorrect, as in scientific inquiry nothing was permanently established, and as such nothing was unalterable. 
Accuracy was also provisional, as all measurements, both of time and space, could be within a certain level. Quest for knowledge was a consequence of the problems faced in attempts made to solve them. Exactness is an illusion, and there is no point in trying to get it. However, this does not mean that since we cannot get a final answer to anything, humankind cannot make progress as the quest for a greater degree of accuracy expands the horizon of our knowledge. Advancement is always possible, but whether we have reached the goal or not would always be open to question. Popper put this argument with reference to two of the greatest scientists, Newton and Einstein. The latter's theory of relativity superseded Newtonian laws of gravitation. Popper established the conjectural nature of scientific knowledge. He contended that no theory could be relied upon as the final truth. At best, one could say that it was supported by every observation so far, and was more precise in terms of prediction than the available alternative, but it was still possible to replace it with a better theory. He denied the traditional assertion that scientists were looking for the maximum degree of probability, given the evidence. On the contrary, statements that carried with them the maximum possible information, which in all probability might be false, were required. Since they were highly falsifiable, they were also highly testable. For Popper, falsification in whole or in part was the anticipated fate of all hypotheses. Therefore, one had to seek criticism, for the bigger the fault, the greater was the prospect for improvement. On the basis of this paradigm, he attacked the theories of Plato, Hegel and Marx. Popper's arguments were very similar to those of the theory of relative truth of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, 1869-1948. Gandhi, like Popper, conceded that it was practically impossible to know the truth, though all of us were its seekers. At best, one knew one's version of it. Gandhi, like Popper, was opposed to any form of dogmatism and determinism. Linguistic philosophy Linguistic philosophy was also critical of traditional political theory. Most of the linguistic philosophers agreed with the logical positivists that metaphysical statements are value judgments, which have emotive and not cognitive value. Philosophy was described as second-order study, devoted to conceptual inquiry. Though linguistic philosophy resembled that of the Vienna Circle, it was more open towards metaphysical experiences due to the influence of Wittgenstein. The latter's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, 1921, contended that there might be truths that could not be expressed through the language of sense experience. Weldon pointed out that the function of political philosophy was not to provide new information about politics and its conclusions, as they had no bearing on the decisions of practical politicians. Moreover, philosophers must refrain from suggesting reforms. Linguistic philosophy dismissed political, philosophical thought as a misconceived inquiry, for it took up the wrong questions. Weldon's thesis about the lack of influence of political thinkers on politicians can be challenged by pointing to the enormous influence Locke exerted on the makers of the American Constitution, President Clinton's reference to Thomas Jefferson, 1743-1826, the inspiration Gandhi derived from John Ruskin, 1819-1900, Henry David Thoreau, 1817-1862, and Count Leo Nikolaevich Tolstoy, 1828-1910, and late Prime Minister Nehru's indebtedness to Fabian collectivism. Weber played a crucial role in exposing the limitations within positivism. He conceded the, value-related, nature of social science inquiry. The human mind does not randomly observe reality. It makes a conscious choice depending on one's interest. He repeatedly stressed that although science was related to values, it could not validate them. An empirical science can teach no one what he ought to do, but only what he can do, and under certain circumstances, what he wants to do. The validation of values is an affair of faith, and besides this perhaps a task of speculative thinking about life, the world, and its meaning, but certainly never an object of a science that is based on experience. The later decades of the 19th century till the end of the Second World War were a bleak period for political theory, Germano 1967. However, this observation ignored the contributions of Bernard Bosanke, 1848-1923, Antonio Gramsci, 1871-1937, Thomas Hill Green, 1836-1882, and Leonard Trelawney Hobhouse, 1864-1929. The challenges posed by positivism and ideology were largely countered by Soren Kierkegaard, 1813-1855, Wilfredo Pareto, 1848-1923, Gatano Mosca, 1858-1941, Henry Bergson, 1859-1941, Alfred North Whitehead, 1861-1947, Benedetto Croce, 1870-1940, Max Scheller, 1874-1928, Robert Michels, 1876-1936, Carl Theodor Jaspers, 1883-1969, and the theorists of the Frankfurt School. With the emergence of political science as a professional discipline, since 1903 political theory was one of the subfields. In the 1920s, Merriam and the University of Chicago School played a key role in attempting to make political science more scientific. Methods and concepts from other fields such as psychology and sociology were incorporated in order to make political science quantitative, an approach stressed by Merriam and Wallers. In the 1920s, despite the increasing use of scientism, there was not much schism between empirical scientific theory and study of the history of ideas. The two were seen as complementary. Science was used for practical reform and further rational public policy.
B E H A V I O U R A L I S M. Though the full import of the behavioral revolution became clear in the 1950s, the roots of the movement emerged in the early years of this century. It reaffirmed many of the basic ideas of American political science, though it brought about a significant change in the research programs within the discipline. In the process, it represented a conservative revolution, Gunnell 1987, 388. Behavioralism, as articulated by Easton, tries to organize research in political science on the model of the natural sciences. It emphasizes the need to develop a pure science of politics, giving a new orientation to research and theory-building exercises within the discipline. In the process, it rejects political theory as a merely chronological and intellectual history of ideas, with no practical relevance in comprehending contemporary political reality. Throughout the 50s, those who were committed to evaluative and prescriptive analysis and study of the classical tradition, perceived scientism of behavioralism as a threat to political theory. The behavioralists, on the contrary, claimed that normative political theory was a serious hindrance to scientific research. It was from these debates that many of the subsequent images of political theory, whether as a world historical activity concerned with criticism and restructuring of political life or as a mode of cognitive science, would emerge. Behavioralism remained the dominant theme even in the 60s in the United States. It focused on the simple question, why do people behave the way they do? It differed from other social sciences by its insistence that our observable behavior both at the level of an individual and a group was the basic unit for analysis, and b, that it was possible to empirically test any explanation of that behavior. It rejected a priori reasoning about human beings in society, and preferred factual and statistical inquiries. It believed that experience alone could be the basis of knowledge. Within this framework, behavioralists analyzed the reasons for mass political participation in democratic countries, elite behavior in the contexts of leadership and decision-making processes, and activities of non-state actors in the international arena, like the multinational corporations, terrorist groups and supranational organizations. The behavioral movement, which came into prominence in the 1950s and 1960s, had its philosophical origins in the writings of Comte in the 19th century, and in the logical positivism of the Vienna Circle in the 1920s. Behavioralism did not accept all the philosophical arguments of the positivists. At a time when behavioralism was gaining wide currency, many social scientists subjected positivism to a critical scrutiny, though behavioralism was strongly influenced by positivism. A behavioralist, like a positivist, will ascertain the correctness of an explanatory theory. He will evaluate explanatory theories in three ways, internal consistency, consistency with respect to other theories that seek to explain related phenomena, and capacity to generate empirical predictions that can be tested against observation. Only empirical testing can decide between competing theories. It is the stress on empirical observation and testing that characterize the behavioral approach. A behavioralist systematically compiles all the relevant facts, quantitative and qualitative, for an evaluation of a theoretical statement. Furthermore, behavioral analysis asserts that all scientific theories and or explanations must in principle be capable of being falsified. This reflects behavioralism's commitment to Popper's revision of traditional positivism, whereby he had substituted the principle of falsification for that of verification, and b. simultaneously identified falsification as the criterion for deciding a scientific from a non-scientific theory. A scientific theory will generate empirical predictions which are capable of being falsified. If they do not do so, they are sophisticated tautologies, elegant and detailed, but unable to explain anything meaningfully. Behavioralists emphasize that a theory should explain something and should be capable of being tested against observation. In the strict sense, positivists and behavioralists would rule out normative theories, as they do not contain empirical and definitional statements, for there can be no room for moral arguments which form the core of normative theory. For instance, Laswell and Kaplan, writing on the classics in political theory, concluded, a rough classification of a sample of 300 sentences from each of the following yielded these proportions of political philosophy, demand statements and valuation, to political science, statements of facts and empirical hypotheses, Aristotle's politics, 25 to 75, Rousseau's social contract, 45 to 55. Machiavelli's prince, by contrast, consisted entirely, in the sample, of statements of political science in the present sense. However, this assumption has been severely criticized by Germano by contending that political theory is neither reductionist behavioral science nor opinionated ideology. It is the critical study of the principles of right order in human social existence. Brecht observes, research upon research can be done, and statement can be piled upon statement, on what Plato, Aristotle, Street, Thomas, Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel and a hundred others of the great philosophers have thought about values and about what science can do regarding them. There is no end of delight for the scholar, and no end of discovery or rediscovery of deep observations, penetrating arguments, appealing speculations. No relativity need tune down our statements about what others said and what their theories were. 
Yet what we are dealing with is history, history of ideas, and history of science, it is not science unless we accept their ideas is still scientifically valid today, and if we do so, it is our responsibility to say how through the old ideas, and through which of them the present crisis in theory can be overcome. Otherwise we merely ignore the problem in a particularly sophisticated manner. Furthermore, Kermano argues that this exercise also has a scientific basis, with roots in internal human experience. It can also be tested and verified. It is based on the Heraclitan doctrine of deep knowing in contrast to much knowing. Sabina also echoed this view. Kermano's emphasis, like M.N. Roy's 1887 1954, position in radical humanism, is on the centrality of human experience, which includes the ethical, metaphysical, and theological dimensions. Any other method for such an inquiry is inadequate, as the basis of political theory building is experiential and not strictly experimental. Gandhi's use of the inner voice to defend an action would meet the approval of this kind of argument. The major tenets of the behavioral credo include the following, 1. Regularities or uniformities in political behavior, which can be expressed in generalizations or theory. 2. Verification or the testing of the validity of such generalizations or theories. 3. Techniques for seeking and interpreting data. 4. Quantification and measurement in the recording of data. 5. Values, as distinguished between propositions, relating to ethical evaluation and those relating to empirical explanation. 6. Systematization of research. 7. Pure science, or the seeking of understanding and explanation of behavior, before utilization of the knowledge for solution of societal problems. 8. Integration of political research with that of other social sciences. Criticism of BEHAVIOURALISM. Behavioralism, like positivism, has been criticized for its mindless empiricism. Both Hempel and Popper reject the narrow inductivist view of scientific inquiry, whereby they argued that a proper inquiry was possible only if relevant facts were supported by clear minimum theoretical expectations. They dismiss inquiries based on the idea of all the facts up to now as irrelevant, for mere fact gathering could never accomplish much. For a collection of all the facts would have to await the end of the world, so to speak, and even all the facts up to now cannot be collected since there are an infinite number and variety of them. Hempel 1966 11. Though positivism tried to move away from a narrow, inductivist approach in the 1950s, the scholars working within the behavioral tradition during the same time still remained committed to the inductive method in research. Their emphasis on data, and consequently downgrading of theory, led to two undesirable tendencies within the behavioral persuasion. The first was a tendency to stress on what could be easily measured, rather than what might be theoretically important. The second was a tendency to concentrate on phenomena that were readily observable, rather than study the covert and profound structural factors that contribute to change and stability within the political system. Behavioralism proclaimed to offer a value-free and scientific theory steering clear of ethical and political bias. They considered a theory good if it was consistent with observation. The shortcomings of behavioralism, as enumerated by Easton, 1997, 15, include the following, 1. A tendency where behavioralism pursued fundamental rather than applied knowledge to distance itself from immediate political reality and neglect the special responsibilities of an intellectual. 2. A conception of scientific method that seemed to direct attention away from human actors and their choices, and towards the conditions that influence and constrain action, resulting, it was claimed, in a subjectless, non-humane discipline, one in which human intentions and purposes played little creative part. 3. The naive assumption that behavioral political science alone was free of ideological presuppositions that might shape its substantive concerns, and its conception of its own methods of inquiry. 4. The uncritical acceptance of a pristine, positivist interpretation of the nature of science, despite much criticism that had already gained credibility even among many of those favorable to the continued use of the scientific method in the pursuit of social understanding. 5. The entrapment in a degree of professionalization that increasingly hampered communication not only with the general public, but even with other disciplines that were no less specialized. 6. An apparent indifference to the resulting fragmentation of knowledge even in the face of the need for the use of this knowledge to solve whole social problems that, by their nature, are undifferentiated as to discipline. 7. An acknowledged inability to deal with value concerns, to describe the nature of the good society, with the denigration of values to a non-scientific, and therefore, non-confirmable status. Much of this criticism of behavioralism were made by critics who felt that the movement was ill-conceived and flawed in its conception. They contended that it was not possible to establish regularities in human behavior, which made it difficult to explain it through the methods of science. According to Germano, the meaning of behavioralism had become elusive. There were many differences within behavioralism, it was not a monolithic group. Many who were self-styled behavioralists did not agree with Laswell for the need to establish a closed society that could be scientifically controlled. They were reticent about the scientific method and began to regard classical political theory appreciatively. 
Conformity with behavioralism in the strictest sense would only lead to a closed society unless there were two changes, one a rejection of rigid reductionism and scientism which may lead to the second, namely a rescue of political theory and restoring it to its former glory. Germano charged behavioralists like Coven, Easton and Waldo for their inability to separate normative political theory from political and ideological doctrines and utopian constructions. He clarified that in criticizing behavioralism, he was not against empirical research, for the great masters like Aristotle, Machiavelli and Mosca undertook such an approach. What I object to is the tendency among the advocates of a so-called scientific as opposed to a philosophical political science to decapitate political science and to argue that only propositions purporting to refer to or describe empirical, sensorially observable, facts may be considered part of political science. The neglect of critical standards in terms of which we order and evaluate our data is the principal defect of the new or behavioralist political science. This neglect often leads to the adoption of uncritical standards which do not hold up at all well to theoretical reflection. The rebirth of political theory would not lead to the neglect of empirical research, but to the correction of claims that such studies constitute the whole of political science. Such a rebirth would focus again on the need for elaborating criteria in order to evaluate political behavior, the importance of paradigm, the crucial question of the highest good and best society for man is man, the dilution of the paradigm for concrete historical conditions, etc. Is political theory dead? In the middle of the 20th century, many observers were ready to write an obituary on political theory. Some spoke of its decline, Coburn 1953 and 1960A, Easton 1953. Others proclaimed its death, Laslet 1957, Dahl 1958. One referred to political theory being in the doghouse, Rima 1962, 1. The major reason for such a dismal view was that the classical tradition in political theory was by and large loaded with value judgments beyond the control of empirical testing. The criticism of normative theory came from the logical positivists in the 1930s, and subsequently from behavioralists. Easton contends that since political theory is concerned with some kind of historical form, it had lost its constructive role. Political theory is practiced by William Dunning, Charles H. McIlvain and George Holland Sabina had declined into historicism, for it dissuaded students from a serious study of value theory. In the past, theory was a vehicle whereby articulate and intelligent individuals conveyed their thoughts on actual direction of affairs and offered for serious consideration some ideas about the desirable course of events. In this way they revealed to us the full meaning of their moral frame of reference. Today, however, the kind of historical interpretation with which we are familiar in the study of political theory has driven from the latter its only unique function, that of constructively approaching a valuational frame of reference. In the past, theory was approached as an intellectual activity whereby the student could learn how he was to go about exploring the knowable consequences and, through them, the ultimate premises of his own moral outlook. Scrutiny of the works by American political theorists reveals that their authors have been motivated less by an interest in communicating such knowledge than in retailing information about the meaning, internal consistency, and historical development of past political values. Dunning, in his three volumes entitled A History of Political Theories, 1902, set the tone for research in political theory. His training as a historian enabled him to approach political theory primarily as offering problems of historical change and sought to unfold the role of political ideas in this process. As a result political theory, for Dunning, becomes a historical account of the conditions and consequences of political ideas. He seeks to uncover the cultural and political conceptions of an age and to isolate the influences of these ideas, in turn, on the social conditions. Easton calls Dunning a historicist, for he deflected political theory from moral consideration and consciously avoided dealing with moral issues in a purely historical context. Dunning perceived political theory as essentially historical as it involved research into issues that arose from observation of political facts and practices. He confined his study to the legal rather than the ethical dimensions of political life, though subsequently his students broadened it to encompass empirical theories of political activity. He regarded moral views as products of caprice, dogmas without justification, hence not worthy of analysis or interpretation. He also neglected the meaning and logical consistency of ideas. McIlvain's The Growth of Political Thought in the West, 1932, used historical research, for he considered political ideas as an effect rather than an influential interacting part of social activity. Being virtual ciphers in the changing patterns of actual life, ideas can have meaning only as a part of a history of theories in which ideas may condition subsequent ideas, but in which they leave no impact upon action. The title of McIlvain's work revealed the historical nature of his study. It tried to show the evolution of ideas in the West on the premise that ideas had a history. It considered ideas as justifying behavior, though they might influence political activity, in the sense that ideas motivated individuals to act. The influence of ideas was exclusively confined to the domain of ideas. McIlvain felt that the history of ideas had a sense of continuity, which was why it made sense to trace its evolution. Unlike Dunning, who regarded ideas as contributing causally to the process of history, McIlvain focused on the historical contexts from which an idea emerged. 
Political theory is here construed as a branch of the sociology of knowledge which deals primarily with the circumstances shaping knowledge as it has varied over time. The task of the political theorist is to show the way in which a social milieu molds and shapes political thought. It is concerned with the exclusively empirical task of uncovering the determinants of ideology. Unlike Dunning, McIlwain's work showed respect for moral issues, since a theory was more than mere propositions rooted in observation. He preferred an inclusive history of theory that paid attention to a political idea which justified political practices and institutions. The moral defense was important, for he was particularly concerned with the way human beings defined good political life. The impression that McIlwain's work gave was that moral issues were worth discussing and endorsing. In spite of the special role he assigned to ideas, he was a historicist, as he was not strongly influenced by moral judgments, the reason being, that he regarded moral standards as unprovable. He contended that in the past, some of the most important assertions remained unproved, because by nature they were unprovable. This made values a matter of personal opinion, representing an emotional response to experience. He believed that moral judgments were subjective and relative, for it was important to affirm one's moral premises. However, that did not deter him from grappling with one of the issues of moral relativism, namely that if all moral beliefs were results of individual life experiences, then could one claim his belief to be better than that of others. Such an argument would only render discussion of values meaningless, for each could set forth his values, which were as good as those of others. In that case only a historical approach was useful to understanding moral problems. McIlwain would not agree to this reasoning, for he believed in the superiority of his own moral outlook. But the fact that he did not go beyond the historical analysis proved that his historicism, in practice, indicates the firm grip that this interpretation of the consequences of moral relativism has upon his study of political theory. The fact that McIlwain confines himself to historicism, however, indicates that he has not availed himself of this alternative conception of the meaning of moral relativism. Sabine's A History of Political Theory, 1937, singularly influenced studies in political theory more than any other book. Like Dunning and McIlwain, Sabina considered the historical study of theory as an appropriate approach to the subject matter. The impression that one got from the book and from a description of his method was that a historical study of theory provides its own self-evident justification, Easton Ibert, 249. Sabina combined the approaches of both Dunning and McIlwain. Like the former, he believed that political thought was a part of the political process which interacted and influenced social action. With the latter, he thought it was necessary to describe and analyze moral judgments in each theory. Sabina considered moral judgments as determining factors in history and not merely rationalizations of an activity. Moral judgments were not inferior to factual propositions, as Dunning contended. Though Sabina reiterated Dunning in his interpretation of the relation between ideas and action, he differed from the latter in his conception of the nature of the history of political theory, by his emphasis on the role of ethical judgments. For Sabina, every political theory could be scrutinized from two points of view, as social philosophy, and as ideology. As ideology, theories were psychological phenomena, precluding truth or falsity. Theories were beliefs, events in people's minds and factors in their conduct, Sabina 1939, 6-7, irrespective of their validity or verifiability. Theories played an influential role in history, and therefore the task of a historian was to ascertain the extent to which these theories helped in shaping the course of history. A theory had to be examined for its meaning, rather than for its impact on human actions. Viewed in this perspective, a theory comprised two kinds of propositions, factual and moral. Sabina focused on factual rather than moral statements, for the latter precluded descriptions of truth or falsity. He regarded values as reflecting human preferences for some social and physical fact. They were not deducible from facts, nor could they be reduced to facts. They were not rationally discovered, as they were expressions of emotions. Since political theory advanced some statements of preference, value judgments formed the core of its theory and explained the reason for its existence. The moral element characterized political theory, which was why it was primarily a moral enterprise. In spite of factual propositions within a theory, a political theory on the whole can hardly be true in depicting a particular episode or period. Easton then examines the reasons for the decline of political theory into historicism. First and foremost is the tendency among political scientists to conform to the moral propositions of their age, leading to a loss of the constructive approach. The emphasis is to uncover and reveal one's values, which implies that there is no longer the need to inquire into the merit of these moral values but merely understand their origins, development and social impact, Easton 1953, 257. History is used to endorse existing values. Second, moral relativism is responsible for the attention this theory receives with history. The vital fact about this meaning of relativism is that the description of the conditions surrounding the emergence of moral preference does not by itself necessarily imply any opinion about the merit or demerit of these preferences. It does not demonstrate values to be either equal or unequal in worth. It merely indicates that they are equal in their origins, in the sense that they are each a product of historical circumstances. 
If we wished, we could of course compare them with regard to other qualities such as their moral worth. This would however be a separate and independent task. To do so we would need first to establish an acceptable moral standard in terms of which varying preferences could be compared. But barring agreement on such a standard, two differing value judgments can be said to be neither better nor worse when each stands by the side of the other. They just differ and are incommensurable until some third standard of comparison is adopted. Third, beginning from the latter half of the 19th century until the early part of the 20th century, there was beyond doubt considerable agreement on values in Western Europe. Sharp differences on ethical questions got diffused. With greater unity in moral perceptions, value theorists focused more on the history of moral ideas. Revival of political theory. In the 1930s, political theory remained a study of the history of ideas, particularly with the purpose of defending liberal democratic theory in opposition to totalitarian communism, fascism and Nazism. The aims and direction given by Merriam were furthered by Laswell, who tried to establish a scientific political theory with the eventual purpose of controlling human behavior. Unlike the classical tradition, scientific political theory would describe rather than prescribe. Political theory in the traditional sense was alive in the works of Arendt, Theodore Adorno, 1903-1969, Herbert Marcuse, 1898-1979, Leo Strauss, 1899-1973, O.K. Schott, Bertrand de Juvenal and Eric Wergelin, 1901-1985. Their views were diametrically opposite to the broad ideas within American political science, namely its commitment to liberal democracy, faith in science and a faith in historical progress. They also rejected political machinism and utopianism in politics. Arendt's main focus was on the uniqueness and responsibility of the individual human being with which she initiated her criticism of behavioralism. She contended that the behavioral search for uniformities in human nature would only contribute towards stereotyping the human being. In The Human Condition, 1958, she observed the unfortunate truth about behaviorism and the validity of its laws is that the more people there are, the more likely they are to behave and the less likely to tolerate non-behavior. Statistically, this will be shown in the leveling out of fluctuation. In reality, deeds will have less and less chance to stem the tide of behavior, and events will more and more lose their significance, that is, their capacity to illuminate historical time. Statistical uniformity is by no means a harmless scientific idea, it is no longer the secret political ideal of a society which, entirely submerged in the routine of everyday living, is at peace with the scientific outlook inherent in its very existence. Arendt rejected the idea of hidden and anonymous forces in history. Like other leading figures in the revival of political theory, she also pointed to the essential incompatibility between ideology and political theory. She was aware of the loss of human experience in the modern world and desired a need to recover a sense of dignity and responsible freedom in human action, seeing it as a basis for the revival of political theory. Through the example of Eichmann, the transportation expert manning the trains to the Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz, a perfectly normal man, she illustrated the difference between responsible action and efficient automatic behavior. Okeshot's main theoretical achievement was his philosophical analysis of experience, which attempted to resurrect the multidimensionality that was denied to experience by positivism and ideology. Okeshot understood experience to be a concrete whole with different kinds of modes. The modes constituted arrests in experience and only from the perspective of philosophy whose purpose was to identify each mode and define its relationship with other aspects of experience. In Experience and its Modes, 1933, he identified four principal modes of or arrests in experience, history, science, practice and poetry. Science concerned itself with measurement and quantification, history with the past, practice with an act of desiring and obtaining, and poetry with imagination and contemplation. Okeshot did not define philosophy other than indicating it to be an activity undertaken in discoursing upon experience and its modes. When philosophizing, one left the tight model islands of incomplete experience and charted the open sea of experience. He conceded that philosophy could not serve as a guide for practical life for it was not clear-sighted, not for those who are fashioned for thought and the arduous of thought, who can lead the world. Great achievements are accomplished in the mental fog of practical experience. What is farthest from our needs is that kings should be philosophers. Ok shot 1933, 320-21. Philosophy served truth. It was not determined by its historical setting. Though its place and time was important, the key question remained, could it maintain what it asserted? Ok shot did not distinguish between subject and object, fact and value. He distrusted any accepted root or pattern which explained his skepticism of rationalism, with its efforts at systematization and categorization. The process of politics and the very basis of rationalist inquiry were incompatible and mutually exclusive. He rejected the contention that philosophy could learn from the methods of science. The understanding of politics as an empirical activity is then inadequate because it fails to reveal a concrete manner of activity at all. And it has the incidental defect of seeming to encourage the thoughtless to pursue a style of attending to the arrangements of their society which is likely to have unfortunate results, to try to do something which is inherently impossible is always a corrupting enterprise. Philosophy, for Okeshot, was not practice and had to be sought for its own sake. 
It had to maintain its independence from all extraneous interests, and in particular, from the practical interest OK shot 1933-3. Philosophy was not about preaching a doctrine, though every philosopher had a preacher within him. It was involved not in persuading others but in making our own minds clear OK shot of it 3. It could not be popular, and any attempt to popularize it would only debase it. Nor was it a search for a universal system which consisted of knowledge about every aspect of reality. A philosopher sought valid and not universal knowledge OK shot of it 1. Political philosophy for OK shot, like Arendt, was philosophizing about politics which did not promise salvation. In this context he rejected ideology, for political philosophy did not promise bogus eternity. Political ideology purports to be an abstract principle or set of related abstract principles which has been independently premeditated. It supplies in advance of the activity of attending to the arrangements of a society a formulated end to be pursued and in so doing it provides a means of distinguishing between those desires which ought to be encouraged and those which ought to be suppressed or redirected. Okeshot ruled out political ideology and empiricism in an understanding of politics. Wherever else politics may begin, they cannot begin in ideological activity. Just as scientific hypothesis cannot appear, and is impossible to operate, except within an already existing tradition of scientific investigation, so a scheme of ends for political activity appears within, and is valuable only when it is related to, an already existing tradition of how to attend to our arrangements. Like Arendt, Okeshot described politics, as an activity of attending to the general arrangements of a collection of people, who in respect of their common recognition of a manner of attending to its arrangements, compose a single community Okeshot Ibit 12. He looked to political relationship as one between peers whose views were mutually important, implying that politics was about persuasion rather than coercion. He rejected the idea of final solutions or ultimate goals in politics, for like human life, politics was continuous, involving endless adjustments. Like Aristotle, Arendt and Burke, he stressed on the limits in politics. Echoing Albert Camus, 1913-1960, he emphasized that the present suffering could never be justified in the name of some abstract vision of the future. Politics did not arise from instant desires nor from general principles, but from existing traditions of behavior. Both political crises and their solutions stem from within a tradition of political activity. In political activity, then, men sail a boundless and bottomless sea, there is neither harbor for shelter nor flow for anchorage, neither starting place nor appointed destination. The enterprise is to keep afloat on an even keel, the sea is both friend and enemy, and the seamanship consists in using the resources of a traditional manner of behavior in order to make a friend of every hostile occasion. As far as political philosophy was concerned, it cannot be called a progressive science. The important thing was history. In fact, it has nothing but a history, which is a history of the problems philosophers have detected and the manner of solution they have proposed, rather than a history of doctrines and systems. Political philosophy cannot be expected to increase our ability to be successful in political activity. It will not help us to distinguish between good and bad political projects, it has no power to guide or to direct us in the enterprise of pursuing the intimations of our tradition. But the patient analysis of the general ideas which have come to be connected with political activity, ideas such as nature, artifice, reason, will, law, authority, obligation, etc. in so far as it succeeds in removing some of the crookedness from our thinking and leads to a more economic use of concepts, is an activity neither to be overrated nor despised. Yuvanal, like Arendt, opposed the modern trend of converting politics into administration, depriving it of the potentiality for creativity in the public sphere. Both conceived politics as a competitive process and were concerned about totalitarianism. They opposed ideological sloganeering and utopianism. Politics essentially involved moral choice, with the purpose of building and consolidating individuals. Strauss, a historian of political thought and an eminent theorist, reaffirmed the importance of classical political theory to remedy the crises of modern times. He doubted the contention that all political theory was ideological in nature, mirroring a given socio-economic interest. All political thinkers were motivated by the possibility of discerning the principles of the right order in social existence. A political philosopher was primarily interested in truth, Strauss 1959, 12. Past philosophies had to be studied with an eye on coherence and consistency, which had to be gathered diligently and ingeniously. The authors of the classics in political theory were superior not only because they were geniuses, but also because they wrote with utmost care, with each word and sentence in its right place and meaning. Strauss scrutinized the methods and purposes of the new political science and concluded that it was defective when compared with classical political theory, particularly that of Aristotle. For Aristotle, a political philosopher or a political scientist had to be impartial, for he possessed a more comprehensive and clear understanding of human ends than those who were partisan. Political science and political philosophy were identical, because science consisting of theoretical and practical aspects was identical with philosophy. Other characteristics of Aristotelian political science were that it evaluated political things, defended autonomy of prudence in practical matters, and viewed political action to be essentially ethical. Behavioralism denied all these premises.
It separated political philosophy from political science, substituted the distinction between theoretical and practical sciences with that between the theoretical and applied sciences, perceiving the latter to be derived from the former, but not in the same manner as was visualized in the classical tradition. Behavioralism was disastrous, for it denied knowledge regarding ultimate principles. The rise of totalitarianism proved the bankruptcy of positivism for it seemed helpless, unable to distinguish right from wrong, just from unjust. Strauss countered Easton's charge of historicism by alleging that it was the new science that was responsible for the decline in political theory, for it pointed to and abetted the general political crisis of the West because of its overall neglect of normative issues. The habit of looking at social or human phenomena without making value judgments has a corroding influence on any preferences. The more serious we are as social scientists, the more completely we develop within ourselves a state of indifference to any goal, or of aimlessness and drifting, a state which may be called nihilism. The social scientist is not immune to preferences, his activity is a constant fight against the preferences he has as a human being and a citizen and which threaten to overcome his scientific detachment. He derives the power to counteract these dangerous influences by his dedication to one and only one value, to truth. 1. It is impossible to study social phenomena, i.e. all important social phenomena, without making value judgments. A society cannot be defined without reference to its purpose. 2. The rejection of value judgments is based on the assumption that the conflicts between different values or value systems are essentially insoluble for human reason. The belief that value judgments are not subject, in the last analysis, to rational control, encourages the inclination to make irresponsible assertions regarding right and wrong or good and bad. One even creates the impression that all important human conflicts are value conflicts, whereas, to say the least, many of these conflicts arise out of men's very agreement regarding values. 3. The belief that scientific knowledge, i.e., the kind of knowledge possessed or aspired to by modern science, is the highest form of human knowledge, implies a depreciation of pre-scientific knowledge. Strauss equated behavioralism's value-free approach with dogmatic atheism and permissive egalitarianism. It was based on dogmatic atheism, for it spotted an attitude of unreasoned unbelief. It was rooted in permissive egalitarianism because the distinction between facts and values meant to its proponents that men can live without ideology, they can adopt, posit, or proclaim values without making the illegitimate attempt to derive their values from facts, or without relying on false or at least inevident assertions regarding what is. One thus arrives at the notion of the rational society or of the non-ideological regime, a society that is based on the understanding of the character of values. Since this understanding implies that before the tribunal of reason all values are equal, the rational society will be egalitarian, or democratic, permissive and liberal, the rational doctrine regarding the difference between facts and values rationally justifies the preference for liberal democracy, contrary to what is intended by that distinction itself. Wergelin thought of the inseparableness of political science and political theory, as without the latter the former was not possible. Political theory was not ideology, utopian or scientific methodology, but an experiential science of the right order in both the individual and society. It dissected critically and empirically the problem of order. Theory is not just any opining about human existence in society, it rather is an attempt at formulating the meaning of existence by explicating the content of a definite class of experiences. Its argument is not arbitrary but derives its validity from the aggregate of experiences to which it must permanently refer for empirical control. The Frankfurt School, to which Adorno and Marcuse belonged, emerged in Germany in the 1920s and attracted some of the best minds of contemporary German social sciences. Its origin could be traced back to a debate about the nature of Marxism that followed the defeat of the left-wing workers' movement in West Europe after the First World War, the collapse of the mass left-wing political parties in Germany, the rise of Stalinism, and with its institutionalization, the total degeneration of the Soviet Revolution and the meteoric rise of fascism and Nazism in Europe, eclipsing Marxism. This bitter experience shattered the school's faith in the inevitability of the historical march towards socialism. Reactions to these events came in the writings of Gramsci within Italy, and from the Frankfurt School within Germany. The school was directly associated with an anti-Bolshevik radicalism and an open-ended or critical Marxism, held 1983-182. It was a para-Marxist movement, Kolokovsky 1981, Vol. 3, 341. The school rejected both capitalism and Soviet socialism, and like the Eurocommunists, tried to project a third alternative. But a great deal of pessimism and anti-utopianism prevented them from projecting a bright future, as was done by Marx himself. With an emphasis on totality and rejection of crude determinism, the members of the school produced a large number of scholarly works in humanistic science, philosophy, empirical sociology, psychoanalysis, theory of literature, law and political theory. Though the works of the members of the school were recognized as a distinct category under the term critical theory, there was no attempt to form a core unity, and the adherents differed widely in their approaches and emphasis. Their commitment ended with a general agreement for a necessity to provide a critical theory of Marxism. They were opposed to all forms of positivism and were critical of any possibility of a value-free social science. 
They rejected Marxist interpretations based on crude materialism or dogma. The most well-known political theorist, Jürgen Habermas, 1929, belongs to this school. His famous theory of legitimization crisis assesses advanced capitalism and communicative action. He is committed to the Enlightenment philosophy of faith in the power of reason and progress, and thus becomes a critic of postmodernism. Kolakowski, Ibit 341-342, lists six basic characteristics of the Frankfurt School, a. It does not treat Marxism as sacrosanct, but as a helpful tool in analyzing and criticizing culture, b. Its program is strictly non-party in orientation, for it never identified with any political movement, either with communism or social democracy. In fact, it is hostile towards both of them, c. It is profoundly influenced by the interpretation of Marxism developed by George Lukacs, 1885-1971, and Karl Kosk, 1886-1961, in the 1920s, d. It is opposed to the concept of praxis and emphasizes autonomy and independence of theory, a. Differing with Lukacs, it accepts the Marxian position on exploitation and alienation of the proletariat, though it did not identify with the Communist Party. The school doubted the proletariat's revolutionary role of liberation and dropped this part of Marx's teaching altogether subsequently, f. In spite of its revisionist outlook, it considered itself a revolutionary intellectual movement rejecting the reformist plank, though it advocated a complete break with the past. Berlin's Views on Political Theory Sir Isaiah Berlin, 1909-1997, started off as a logical positivist but the First World War led him to develop a critical response towards it. He was unconvinced about the anti-metaphysical claims of the logical positivists. At the same time he also doubted the contention that problems of philosophy were problems arising from linguistic confusion. His criticism of logical positivism was compiled and published as Concepts and Categories, 1978, in which he contended that our understanding of reality already includes the conception of it as existing independently of us and our understanding, so that our reflection of what we mean when we characterize that reality cannot accommodate the positivist idea that truths about reality should be equivalent to truths about us, Williams, 1980, XII. Berlin rejected Okeshott's proposal that dilemmas insoluble by reason could be resolved by going back to tradition. He considered philosophy to be important, for it highlighted the incoherence of practices though it could not resolve them. He opposed philosophy, proposing radical social reforms, for its role had to be humble to straighten the crookedness in our thoughts. The goal of philosophy is always the same, to assist men to understand themselves and thus operate in the open, and not wildly, in the dark Berlin 1992, 49. Berlin's conception of the role and function of philosophy was linked to his idea of freedom and pluralism, namely the existence of an indefinite number of competing and irreconcilable ultimate values from which a choice had to be made, and that this choice could not be forced on others. He denied that a structure of liberties within a liberal society could be derived from any theory, or formulated in any system of principles, since the choice among conflicting liberties was often a choice among incommensurables. He zealously defended the idea of individuality and human diversity, and distrusted all general schemes of human improvement that did not take into account local history, culture and social conditions. He believed that any effort to harmonize the divergences that exist among human beings would only lead to violence and suffering. Berlin accepted that it was the absence of a commanding work in the 20th century that led to the declaration that political theory was dead or dying. The reason for this was the absence of critical dimension, and had nothing to do with the nature of political theory. Political philosophy could survive in a society in which ends collided, for in a society dominated by a single goal there could, in principle only, be arguments about the best means to attain this end, and arguments about means are technical, that is, scientific and empirical in character, they can be settled by experience and observation or whatever other methods are used to discover causes and correlations, they can, at least in principle, be reduced to positive sciences. In such a society no serious questions about political ends or values could arise, only empirical ones about the effective paths to the goal. It follows that the only society in which political philosophy in its traditional sense, that is, an inquiry concerned not solely with the elucidation of concepts, but with the critical examination of presuppositions and assumptions, and the questioning of the order of priorities and ultimate ends, is possible, is a society in which there is no total acceptance of any single end. Berlin was convinced that political philosophy in the traditional sense could be pursued only in a pluralist society, for any kind of analysis involved a critical inquiry, and that was not possible under rigid monism. Monists were Platonists, Aristotelians, Stoics, Thomists, Positivists and Marxists, who understood political problems in scientific terms and saw solutions to human problems as being technical, for human ends were objective in accordance with some discoverable laws. The pluralists did not see the possibility of human perfection and distrusted empirically the possibility of attaining the final solution to the deepest human problems. Skeptics and relativists were pluralists. Berlin pointed out that philosophical analysis brought out the sharp differences that existed between concepts and value preferences. Political thinkers searched for validity and truth in an attempt to understand whether a model distorted reality. Disputes and doubts could arise regarding values and the relationship between values. 
These questions are not purely technical and empirical, not merely problems about the best means to a given end, nor are they mere questions of logical consistency, that is formal and deductive, but properly philosophical. Wallen's defense of the classical political tradition. Traditional political theory did not get marginalized under the dominance of behavioralism. In the premier American universities, important works in political theory emerged in the 1950s and 1960s. An important critic of behavioralism, Sheldon Wallen accuses behavioral political scientists of abdicating their true vocation in their concern for method. He not only addresses the attack mounted on traditional political theory by behavioral social scientists, but also explains the beauty and usefulness in the tradition of political theory from Plato to contemporary times. He offers comments on the substance and significance of political theory, along with suggestions on how to revitalize political theory or political philosophy. Wallen's masterpiece, Politics and Vision, Continuity and Innovation in Western Political Thought, 1960, conveys his view that political theory represents, seeing, political phenomena in two senses. The first, and more obvious, is that political theory provides a description of the political. The second, and more significant, is that political theory constitutes a form of aesthetic or religious vision, Wallen, 1960, 18. In the second sense, political theory relates to the imaginative capacity of the theorist, an esemplastic, power that forms all into one graceful intelligent whole, Wallen Ibert, 18. Through fanciful statements, a theorist exaggerates aspects of political phenomena in an abstract manner, the interconnection of which is invisible, with the purpose of illuminating it. Imagination is necessary since no political theorist has the capacity to observe all political things directly. This imaginative element of seeing is described as an architectonic vision, for political phenomena are portrayed and shaped in the light of a vision of good which lies external to the political order. This ordering element has differed throughout tradition. It was religious, historical and in recent times economic, but all of them possess one common trait, a futuristic quality, a projection of the political order into a time that is yet to be, Wallen Ibit, 20. Besides, through an exaggerated portrayal of the political order, one can get an idea of the possibilities of political life that serves as a necessary complement to action, Wallen Ibert, 20. In his subsequent writings, Wallen classifies political visionaries as epic theorists. An epic theory differs from other kinds of theories and methods by its structure of formal features and its structure of intentions, Wallen 1969, 1078. Comparing it to Kuhnian paradigms, an epic theory ushers in a new way of looking at the world by reassembling existing political institutions and relationships. All epic theories are governed by a public concern, a quality which is important for anyone engaged in the enterprise of political theory. By public concern, Wallen means two things. First, the object examined is common to the whole community, and in this context he mentioned Cicero's description of the commonwealth as a res publica, a public thing. Second, philosophy, as pointed out at the outset, is intrinsically public for it gives knowledge that enables individuals to become wiser in their conduct of life. Epic theories surface mainly during times of crisis. The range of possibilities appears infinite, for now the political philosopher is not confined to criticism and interpretation, he must reconstruct a shattered world of meanings and their accompanying institutional expressions, he must in short, fashion a political cosmos out of political chaos. However, Wallen did not say that epic theory emerges only in times of crisis. Though crisis brings forth an epic theory, even during periods of tranquility the possibility of political chaos leads to a search for order and stability. Epic tradition is also inspired by the fact of immortality, the hope to achieve a memorable deed through the medium of thought, Wallen 1970, 4. The purpose of great minds is not to merely state the logical or factual merits of the words but an attempt to compel admiration and offer the magnitude of the achievement, Wallen Ibert, 5. Wallen pointed out that a political theorist tried to understand and alter the whole of politics, but the whole, he knows was with reference to a particular context. Theorizing about politics contained a paradox. A theorist aimed to provide an understanding about the whole of politics but, compelled by necessity, he reduced the whole to manageable proportions, emphasizing some aspects at the expense of others, Wallen 1968, 319. Every political philosophy represented a necessarily limited perspective from which it viewed the phenomena of political nature, Wallen 1960, 21. Wallen also pointed to another aspect of the relationship between the existing political order and political theory, namely that institutions establish a previous coherence among political phenomena, hence, when the political philosophy reflected upon society, the political theorist was not confronted by a whirl of disconnected events or activities hurtling through a democritan void but by phenomena already endowed with coherence and interrelationships Wallen Ibert, 7. The existing coherence was given by a continuous tradition of political thought, and it was this tradition that posed as the biggest inhibitor for the theorist. Previous theorists bequeath the legacy, namely the function of preserving the insights, experience, and refinements of the past, and compelling those who would participate in the Western political dialogue to abide by certain rules and usages, Wallen Ibert, 22. 
Though the philosophical inheritance might circumscribe the terms of the discourse, it also facilitated it by providing familiar vocabulary, concepts and terminology allowing fresh insights and new interpretations. Each theorist confronted the fundamental issues of his time and place, but in the process the issues were scrutinized by the insights of the past for the purpose of their applicability to the present. As a result, a political philosopher unavoidably infects his own thought with past ideas and situations. In this sense the past is never wholly superseded, it is constantly being recaptured at the very moment that human thought is seemingly preoccupied with the unique problems of its own time. The result is, to borrow Butri's phrase, a coexistence of diverse elements, partly new, partly inherited, with the old being distilled into the new, and the new being influenced by the old. Thus the Western tradition of political thought has exhibited two somewhat contradictory tendencies, a tendency towards an infinite regress to the past and a tendency towards cumulation, or a tendency towards acquiring new dimensions of insight. The combination between the insights from the past with those of the present gave to the Western political tradition not a fund of absolute political wisdom, but rather a continuously evolving grammar and vocabulary to facilitate communication and to orient the understanding, Wallenibud, 26-27. Viewed in this perspective, individual theorists in the Western political tradition have to be studied best in the light of historical development. Since the history of political philosophy is, as we shall see, an intellectual development wherein successive thinkers have added new dimensions to the analysis and understanding of politics, an inquiry into that development is not so much a venture into antiquarianism as a form of political education. Through the example of Arendt's writings, Wallen showed how the great theories of the past might be used to illuminate the predicaments of the age Wallen 1977, 92-93. He described Arendt's theorizing as an act of recovery, or reacquiring lost meanings of remembering, Wallenibut, 96. Theories of the past should be used for a better understanding of politics, but they need not be judged in light of contemporary standards alone. Wallen echoed Germano when he observed that in its concern for method, contemporary political theory had abandoned the critical dimension, which was always been one of its major characteristics. It no longer furnished a radical critique of the basic principles of politics, as there has been an effort to imbue political scientists with what is understood to be the ethic of science, objectivity, detachment, fidelity to fact, and deference to intersubjective verification by a community of practitioners. Wallen distinguished between a scientist and a theorist, for both tried to clarify an individual's view of the world, but only the former attempts to change the world itself. Kuhn's Seminal Contribution Thomas Kuhn, 1922-1996, observed that in every age a discipline solved some of its problems but in the process generated new ones. His observation was made with reference to the natural sciences, but it was equally valid in the social sciences and could be seen as a critique of the behavioral quest for a standardized scientific theory and explanation. His notion of paradigm is research firmly based upon one or more past scientific achievements, achievements that some particular scientific community acknowledges for a time as supplying the foundation for its further practice, interested social scientists, Kuhn 1970, 10. A paradigm was a perspective, a set of beliefs and ideals, conceptual, theoretical and methodological, of a scientific community helping the latter in the selection of problems, evaluation of data and formulation of theory. In perceiving the nature of a paradigm, Kuhn conceded the difficulty of discovering rules that would help scientific traditions. The concepts, laws and theories of science were found historically in prior experience, not in abstract, and they became the basis of scientific learning and research. A paradigm established limits of what was possible and stated the boundary with regard to inquiry. A successful paradigm helped the scientific community in the selection of problems and finding solutions. A scientist working with the help of a successful paradigm normally did not see beyond his assumptions. First, the preparadigmatic phase, in which no single theoretical approach or school predominated within a scientific community, although there might be a number of competing approaches. Second, the paradigmatic phase, in which the scientific community followed a dominant paradigm. Third, the crisis phase, where the dominant paradigm faced challenges and revisions, allowing a new paradigm to evolve, with a possibility of reviving an old one with appropriate modifications. Fourth, the scientific revolution phase, which occurred when the scientific community shifted to different paradigms. The traditional, behavioral and post-behavioral approaches did not fit into the Kuhnian definition and analysis of paradigm, Chilcote 1981, 58-59. Wallen, 1968, observes that no scientific revolution has occurred, and as such there exists no such dominant and new theory among political scientists along the lines suggested by Kuhn. There is no significant theory like that of Newton, except a framework of guiding assumptions, the ideological paradigm reflective of the same political community, that applies to political science, Wallen, 1969, 1064. Kuhn's work along with new challenges in the philosophy of social science, such as those advanced by Peter Winch and Alfred Schutz, to the idea of positivistic social science, began to spill over into political theory. Much of the discussion in the 1970s was devoted to metatheoretical debates about the nature of social scientific theory and explanation. 
while the earlier critique of behavioralism had raised questions about the value of science as such and had largely accepted the same positivist conception of science as behavioralism, the new critique questioned not only the idea of the methodological unity of science but the adequacy of the prevailing conception of natural science. These debates weakened the claims of positivism. Political scientists began to devote more to policy and substantive issues than to just having a scientific image. Policy sciences and theories like rational choice and the prisoner's dilemma started to receive much attention. Post BEHAVIOURALISM and NEO BEHAVIOURALISM. In 1969, Easton announced a new revolution in political science, post behavioralism. It placed less emphasis on the scientific method and empirical theory, and laid more stress on the public responsibilities of the discipline. The tenets of post behavioralism included the following. First, substance preceded technique, which meant the pressing problems of society became tools of investigation. Second, behavioralism itself was seen as ideologically conservative and limited to abstraction, rather than to the reality of the times in crisis. Third, science could be evaluatively neutral, for facts were inseparable from values, and value premises had to be related to knowledge. Fourth, intellectuals had to shoulder the responsibilities of their society, defend human values of civilization, and not become mere technicians insular to social problems. Fifth, the intellectual had to put knowledge to work and engage in reshaping society, and sixth, the intellectual must actively participate in the politicization of the professions and academic institutions, Easton 1969. The behavioralists accepted that theoretical analysis had to remain the starting point of any serious empirical research. In fact, theory not only played a pivotal role in post-behavioral analysis, but also accepted the possibility of different theories yielding different observations. This possibility made the task of subjecting rival theories to empirical testing far more complex. For the post-behavioralists, a theory, in order to be treated as an explanatory theory, in the first place has to be evaluated, i.e. tested empirically. Easton, 1997, 16-17 also pointed out that dissatisfaction with behavioralism led to revisions in the method and content, favoring a revival of interpretive understanding and historical analysis, and a complete rejection of systematic methodology, at the same time emphasizing the need to introduce formal modeling and rational actor deductivism. Moreover, new concerns such as feminism, environmentalism, ethnicity, racial identity and equality and nuclear war have emerged. There is a general loss of central focus regarding the subject matter and consensus about methodologies. He announced the beginning of new behavioralism in order to bring about a new unity in the theoretical focus of the discipline. Why is the classical tradition important? A distinctive aspect of the history of political theory is the large number of classics known for their comprehensiveness, logical consistency and clarity. These works, rightly described as classics, address both local issues and contain principles of universal significance. They offer rival conceptual frameworks which enable us to choose and state our preference. In spite of the bewildering variety among the classics, it is possible to list the major subjects that they address. These are the characteristics of human nature and the basis of rational motivation, the reasons for society, the nature, functions and organization of political authority, and political change and stability. The classics in political theory normally arise during periods of acute crisis or great transition and not during settled times. They usually flourish in an age of transition from one era to another, when a great churning occurs and issues are debated and discussed. The crisis by itself does not produce, instead it acts as a catalyst. There are exceptions. For instance, Indian society in the 17th and 18th centuries witnessed tumultuous changes marked by crises and stresses but did not yield any political theory. Therefore a crisis has to be understood in the context of a framework of political values and institutional arrangements. The quest for a good life and good society, optimism and hope are the major inputs in a worthwhile project in political theory. A situation of hopelessness usually deters political theorizing. The text of a political theory has also to be understood with reference to a specific situation in order to comprehend the contents of the political philosophy of that period. Theories of politics are themselves a part of politics. In other words they do not refer to an external reality but are produced as a normal part of the social milieu in which politics itself has its being. Reflection upon the ends of political action, upon the means of achieving them, upon the possibilities and necessities of political situations, and upon the obligations that political purposes impose as an intrinsic element of the whole political process. Thus conceived, the theory of politics no more reaches an end than politics itself, and its history has no concluding chapter. This, as Sabina cautions us, should not be overemphasized. In spite of the fact that political theory reflects particular incidents, it cannot be dismissed as being relevant to that particular event alone. The important thing that Sabina seeks to emphasize is that even in localized events, the perennial issues of politics find a place. A political theorist turns to the past with a view to analyzing the present and foreseeing the future. It is this defining element that makes a political tract of a particular period a masterpiece. Though there may be different reactions to a particular situation, one could also find similarities in the responses patterns. 
Among the varied responses, some authors may have perceptive insights and effectiveness, which is why their works occupy a position of preeminence. The greatest political theories are those that have dealt with the immediate situation and issues effectively, while suggesting lessons which are valid for other times as well. It is like the themes of Shakespearean plays enjoying timelessness being valid for all times and places. The classics in political theory are no different. Sabina also tells us that in its attempt to deal with the totality, a political theory text has to take into account small details. It has to be careful while deliberating for posterity. A text has to be logically constructed, descriptive and convincing enough to be able to persuade its readers about its point of view. Though a theorist is not a disinterested observer, his account cannot be partisan. Political theory is not sloganeering either. It is neither a tactical maneuver in class struggle nor a participant in the national aspiration for power. A political theory must contain three elements, a factual statements, b, what is likely to happen, and c, what ought to happen, i.e. the desirable thing to happen. Therefore it is not one-dimensional. In analyzing particular situations, it must attempt the ideal. It must not contain properties that could be contradicted by rational criticism. The great classics were composed by political exiles or by failed politicians like Plato, Machiavelli, Hugo Grotius, 1583-1645, Sir John Fortescue, 1394-1476, Hobbes and Locke. At times, political theory, as Sir Leslie Stephen remarked, is the child of a revolution or an indication of an impending one. Plato and Aristotle sought to recreate the magic and preeminence of the Greek city-states or the polis which were fast fading into the past. Besides Italian unification, Machiavelli focused on the various dimensions of the newly emerging commercial society. Hobbes and Locke addressed questions relating to crises of political authority in times of English civil war. The classics in political theory give us explanations about politics, its meaning and value. In that sense, a historical understanding of the classics becomes imperative, for the texts are in response to actual political reality. The relationship between theory and reality remains important. A theorist supplies a critical faculty with the purpose of explaining, defending or questioning that reality. In the process, a theorist also imagines a framework of political organization different from present practices. Though a theorist theorizes within the existing political practices, he may depart from it when framing their ideal. Besides being influential, a classic in political theory, as in other fields contains a wealth of information, ideas and values that cumulatively enriches human thought and action. A great theorist is one who articulates logically with rigor, insight and subtle nuances the dilemmas of his age, and dissects the problems that confront the generation to which he belongs. He stands out among his contemporaries not so much for originality of ideas, rather rare in human thought, but for the incisiveness, clarity, and power of the doctrines. Scientific invention or discovery is practically out of reach for a political theorist. What he can aspire for, at best, is comprehension and articulation of the spirit and temper of his age, linking them with new ideas and events within a framework of refinement and advancement. Political theory, like any intellectual inquiry, is partly a communication with the past, establishing an empathy with the great minds and having a continuous discourse with history. This in itself could be a disenchanting exercise, as Stephen Spender compared it to an obstacle race where philosophers race, maneuvering and navigating logical obstructions, with some getting ahead of others. Moreover every age is characterized by its own problems and dilemmas, so it is important to identify and understand the trends in a particular time period. But such localism need not be a hindrance to the essential richness of a classic as demonstrated by Aristotle's politics, which justified the prejudices of its time, like slavery, but was able to offer brilliant insights into the basic issues of politics, like stability, revolutionary change, the importance of family and property in sustaining the state. Sabina considers it remarkable that in the course of 2,500 years, two periods of approximately 50 years each, and at both times confined to highly restricted sections, political theory flourished. These two periods are the 5th century BC during the time of Plato and Aristotle, and the 17th century, the phase of the English Civil War of 1641 till the Glorious Revolution of 1688, with Hobbes and Locke as the principal theorists. Both these periods witnessed changes of momentous significance in the course of European social and intellectual history. The first period saw the collapse of the city-states and their replacement from their position of cultural leadership, surely indicative of the moral and political upheaval of the ancient world. The second period saw the formation of the first constitutional state on national lines, creating the basis of scientific and intellectual changes that governed the Western world at least till 1914. Sabina links fundamental developments in political theory to the shifts that take place from one set of formation to another. In other words, innovation in political theory occurs when the older institutions become inoperative and newer ones emerge. Crises and tumultuous changes have a catalytic effect on political theory. Germano, 1967, 37 to 44, identifies the characteristics of an authentic political theory, common to all classics from Plato to Hegel. These are openness, theoretical intention, focus on universal, perennial problems, realism, acknowledging the limits to knowledge, and intellectual honesty and integrity. 
In elaborating these characteristics, Germano points out that a theorist exhibits an ability to transcend his narrow concerns by maintaining a critical distance and addresses issues of larger importance. A theorist interprets reality to be able to focus on questions of perennial concern. Hacker, 1954, in his reply to Easton, points out that the great books in political theory should be saved, for they offer insights not only into the time period in which they were written, but also into contemporary times. He points out that a theory has two functions. It should not only explain behavior, causal theory, but also tell how individuals ought to behave, ethical theory. He classifies the great books into ten categories, advising how they have to be studied. Capital and Carbuncles, essentially biographical in nature, tells us how a particular book came to be written in a particular way. Hero Worshippers takes into account all the writings of a single author. Intellectual plagiarism tells us of the indebtedness of a theorist to his predecessors and contemporaries. Who said it first tells us, for instance, that Aristotle was the father of political science, Machiavelli the father of modern political thought, Comte the father of sociology, and so on. The mind readers gives us an idea of what the theorist really desired to convey. The camera eye offers us the thoughts some had during certain historical periods. For instance, the contrasting analysis of Edmund Burke, 1729-1797, and Thomas Paine, 1737-1809, during the French Revolution familiarize us with the responses of different groups to a particular event. Influencing the intelligentsia is similar to intellectual plagiarism, with the difference that some theorists like Bosanke become important because of Hegel and Green's influence on his writings. Influencing the masses includes books that are directly linked to political events. For instance, Locke's two treatises intimately connected with the events leading to the Glorious Revolution. The logic book makes a text important for its logical nature. Finally, timelessness explains the continuing relevance of the classics, for they offer insights and solutions that remain valid till date. For instance, Aristotle's comparative method, analysis of revolutions, role of the middle class, Machiavelli's advice to political rulers, Hobbes' emphasis on commodious living, Rousseau's notion of popular sovereignty, are cited in the political discourse of today. It is for these reasons that Hacker contends the need to preserve the great books, for they remain valuable both as explanations and prescriptions. If approached in the aforesaid manner, they form the central theme of political theory. How to study the classics? There is considerable disagreement as to whether emphasis should be given to historical contexts in which political theorists write or analyze these ideas, divorced from the time and context from which they arise. The textualist approach, dominant since 1945, holds that classics in political thought can be studied without reference to their historical context, as exemplified in the writings of Hacker, 1961, and Playman does, 1963. Political theory is considered as a subcategory of philosophy and its central concerns are to clarify concepts used in political discourse and debate and second, to critically examine and evaluate political beliefs and principles, Raphael 1990, Haywood, 1999. The textualists allege that while historical understanding of the milieu in which these texts have originated may give us some insights but they do not play a central role in interpreting them. Skinner, 1966, Pocock, 1971, Dunn, 1979, and Collini, 1983, are the leading exponents of contextualism. They contend that a mere textual approach is inherently weak, for it overlooks the historical background, namely the purpose and the motivation and the intention behind a text. Every text is the result of a conscious effort of the authors. To ignore the historical context could lead to an error in interpreting and understanding the texts. Macpherson, 1973, pays attention to the concerns of the author by situating him in the historical society in which the text was composed. This approach emphasizes that political theory itself has a history, Ashcraft 1986, Dunn 1979, Tully 1988. The contextualists are skeptical about the claims of the textualists who assert that there are universal and timeless questions and problems that the great political texts of the past raise. Skinner maintains that to suggest that these writings provide answers to fundamental political questions that confront contemporary society is far-fetched. The political and moral assumptions and beliefs that underlie the great works of political theory are historically specific creation. The great works raise questions and provide answers that should be viewed as relative to the particular societies and cultures from which they emerged. The contextualists point out that to understand the formulations and theoretical statements about politics it is necessary to stress the interrelationship between political theory and practice. The texts are in response to specific events, controversies, debates and crises reinforcing Berkey's observation that political thought issues out of practical experience and not the other way around, 1977-32. The historians of political thought also point out that the writers of the past intended to communicate with particular audiences. Only when we comprehend the writers' intentions, their use of language and the words that prevailed at that point of time can one understand the meaning of these texts. Merely reading it without any reference to time and social, economic and cultural milieu would be to approach the texts in the biblical sense as if their meaning can be ascertained simply by reading it and reflecting on its universal message Perky Ibit 31. In interpreting classics, one must keep the time period of the text in mind. 
This enables us to see the way a word has been defined, the different meanings that it gives rise to and the intentions of the author, and related to the immediate social and political environment, the aims and purpose of writing the text, how well the author has tackled the problems with a with his contemporaries, and finally the meaning of the text today. It is through the consideration of these aspects that we can perhaps understand why, among a host of innumerable tracts, only some have been elevated to the status of classics. It also helps to see and appreciate the plurality of ideas that exists within a particular time frame. For example, Rousseau's attempt to distinguish between government, democracy, state and sovereignty is a case in point. The word sovereignty was used to describe the power of the people acting as lawmakers themselves and not through their representatives. Neither was sovereignty a characteristic of the state. It differed from the government which administered and enforced the law but could not make the law. Sovereignty meant the exercise of power by the people directly. The diverse contributions of Rousseau make him a genius, in the opinion of Catlin. Since political theory is by and large descriptive, a historical approach is important, for that would help us to see how political theory varies according to time and circumstances. It helps, as Dunning says, to know the successive transformation of a particular idea or concept, or as Sabina says, the reinterpretation and readaptation of received beliefs and theories. Furthermore, as Sabina argues, our examination of the history of political theories reveals that its literature is not a product of a laboratory. The authors have an eye fixed on the public forum, and if political theories are produced in quantities, then it is a symptom that society itself is undergoing a period of stress and strain. Another way of approaching texts is by placing them in the tradition of Western political theory or philosophy. Such an approach has been used by Strauss, 1952, and Wallen, 1960. They understand the tradition, not as a chronological sequence of books and writers, but as a narrative discourse in which the writer consciously articulates and elaborates a theme. Strauss argued that political philosophers from Plato to Hegel grappled with the problem of natural right, namely stating and justifying transhistorical standards of right or justice. The Greeks defended this proposition, whereas modern theorists reject it. For both philosophical and political reasons, Strauss favored the Greek position and characterized modern political theory as degenerative, for it gave rise to ethical relativism and the death of political theory as it was practiced. The moderns looked to comfort, affluence, and avoidance of death to mean good life, which could be secured not through rational understanding, but by gaining power over nature. The premoderns rejected this view, for they considered human desires as insatiable, making it difficult to realize happiness. Moreover, mere scientific power without a knowledge of ends would only lead to crude hedonism. As a result, modern thought rejected divine revelation, eternal nature or inevitable history as contributing a yardstick for measurement, leading to uncritical acceptance of liberal democracy without exploring alternatives. Strauss did not regard political philosophy as a historical discipline. Though knowledge of history was important for political philosophy, it is only preliminary and auxiliary to political philosophy, it does not form an integral part of it, Strauss 1949-30. Furthermore, refuting the claim that a text was historically conditioned, Strauss observed that every political situation consisted of elements that could be found in other political situations as well, and that explained why a classic was evergreen. Wallen contends that traditional political theory attempted to define the dignity, distinctiveness and the importance of the political, which disintegrated since the 17th century, leading eventually to the decline and sublimation of the political. Within this framework, he selected thinkers for whom the political was primary, general and integrative. It is imperative to discern the philosophical teachings of thinkers who try to clarify the meaning of the political, rather than focus on their historical backgrounds. The philosophical content should not be confused for historical understanding. Many, like Pocock 1962, 1971, 1980, Dunn 1968A, Skinner 1969, and Gunnell 1978, reject the idea that it is possible to identify a unity in tradition, and that the great masters were engaged in a common activity, or addressed some common issues. Many see the classics as addressing questions and elucidating themes that are of perennial interest. Such a perspective is offered by Hacker 1961, Playmentas 1963, and Blurn 1965. Viewed in this manner, political theory is perceived as a complex and comprehensive activity that deals with universal and eternal issues to convince readers that the classics are relevant to contemporary times. However, mere historical study is not sufficient. Care must be taken to see that the texts do not get submerged within the pages of history. As Ian Hampshire Monk, 1992, ex-she, points out that such an approach would stifle their capacity to formulate statements with any reference beyond the historically parochial, thus denying them any significance for contemporary times. Emphasis on the historical context of the text might result in the possibility of the writer and text getting fragmented and disappearing into context. It is important to look for consistency, coherence, clarity, truth, reliability and certainty in the text, for that would enable us to see how best a text is in terms of providing a conceptual paradigm. Each text advances, defends and justifies a set of values or preferences, and it is important to see how best it does it. 
For this one must look at the internal consistency of a text, and then compare it with that of others written in and during that time, for such a relative assessment will tell us why, out of a plethora of books only some become great or immortal. Sabina feels that it is possible to enumerate the properties that political theories have actually had, and examine a variety of questions relating to the truth and validity of political theories. There is moreover a need to recognize that there exists a broad Western political tradition to which diverse political thinkers, from different circumstances and concerns adhere to. Notwithstanding the wide variations there exists a history of political thought, one broadly defined, yet coherent tradition of political discourse. We are not faced with a chaotic world of disembodied ideas and texts, but with a concrete world of interlacing and interweaving visions, Berkey 1977, 36-37. Some thinkers have treated the past as a treasure trove from which they can draw for their own purposes, Moro 1998, 5. Rawls says he is reviving and updating Kant and Nozick of Locke thus continuing, with the ancient practice of pillaging the classics in search of ideas and styles to be revived for their own time, Tuck 1993, 72. Aristotle in politics refutes many of the formulations of Plato's Republic. Paine provides a liberal defense of the French Revolution in response to Burke's conservative critique. Wollstonecraft is critical of Burke and Rousseau in her formulations of the first principles of feminism. A classic can be interpreted from a philosophical perspective that is by its efforts at developing a set of moral principles for the purpose of evaluating political events and guiding political choice. The important fact is that moral concepts are embodied in and are partly constitutive of forms of social life. One key way in which we may identify one form of social life as distinct from another is by identifying differences in moral concepts. McIntyre 1971, 1. The philosophical approach bestows upon the reader, scholar the role of a judge for the idea is to evaluate the differing conceptions of moral principles and political theories. A noticeable fact that emerges while interpreting the classics is that the history of political theory is marked by both continuity and change. Concepts undergo a change in the course of their evolution, yet one can see a remarkable continuity. Originality lies in the course of their interpretation and redefinition. This explains the complexities and intricacies within the tradition. Classics are also reinterpreted following new frameworks of analysis. For example, feminism has enabled us to take a fresh look at the texts with certain questions in mind like the position accorded to women, perceptions regarding sexual relations, the home as a place of equality and justice. The Republican view of politics has led to reinterpretation of thinkers like Machiavelli, the authors of the Federalist Papers and Locke from the standpoint of their analysis of the public space, civic virtues and the obligations of private citizens towards their states. Classics are an indispensable part of liberal arts education, because their authors engage themselves and their readers in a discourse of the problems and issues of their time and place. Such an understanding heightens the appreciation of the possibilities and limits of political action and theorizing. The importance of the classical tradition has been succinctly captured by Strauss. The return to classical political philosophy is both necessary and tentative or experimental. We cannot reasonably expect that a fresh understanding of classical political philosophy will supply us with recipes for today's use. For the relative success of modern political philosophy has brought into being a kind of society to which the classical principles as stated and elaborated by the classics are not immediately applicable. Only, we living today can possibly find a solution to the problems of today. But an adequate understanding of the principles as elaborated by the classics may be the indispensable starting point for an adequate analysis, to be achieved by us, of present-day society in its peculiar character, and for the wise application, to be achieved by us, of these principles to our tasks. Limitations of the classical tradition. It is important to keep in mind that the classics, in spite of their timelessness, exhibit limitations and shortcomings. As Hegel rightly stated, every thinker is a child of his time, and this is reflected in their perceptions and theories too. Plato and Aristotle wrote to an audience whose social base was narrow. Their ideal was the city-state or the polis with limited citizenship, excluding the majority. They were forgotten in the immediate context of the post-Aristotelian philosophies of Stoicism, Epicureanism and Cynicism. This narrow perception led to what Sabina calls a politics of withdrawal. Machiavelli's prescriptions could not anticipate the Reformation within the Christian Church. Hobbes considered his portrayal of human nature to be universal. Hegel's glorification of the state led to its exaltation at the cost of civil society. Marx virtually misrepresented capitalism. J.S. Mill was confident that representative democracy would not succeed in backward and or heterogeneous societies only. One can find a similar bias even in commentaries on the classics, as evident from a change in interpretation with regard to most of the great masters. Gender bias. Most mainstream philosophers have either ignored or dismissed cursorily the position and status of women. They have reiterated, justified and defended women's subordination on the alleged natural and biological differences between the sexes, and have also pointed to the inherent physical and mental superiority of the male. In doing so, they have reinforced the stereotyped image of the woman as an emotional, irrational and sensual person in need of male guidance and domination. In many cases this has been without a critical examination of their personal biases and prejudices. 
Most of them, which includes Aristotle, Rousseau and Hegel, contend that a woman's rightful place is her home, and that being burdened with household chores she did not have sufficient time for politics, philosophy, art or science. While they articulate the need for men to have leisure time to devote to public causes and universal issues, they presume that women did not feel similarly. Rousseau and Hegel regarded women as subversive to the unity and order of the polity, and were willing to deny them citizenship rights. Even Kant, who spoke of moral equality and the importance of moral law, precluded women. Plato, in the Republic 380-370 BC, was one of the earliest exponents of total political and sexual equality. He observed that women could perform functions that men did. But he too abandoned this idea and defended the patriarchal family system in the second best state developed in the laws 350 BC. The ideas of freedom, equality, individuality, personal autonomy, contractualism and voluntarism which ushered in the modern period also brought about a significant transformation in the lives of both men and women. The early liberals were the first to accept the idea of sexual equality. They attacked patriarchy. They considered women as human beings with minds of their own, regarding them as free, equal and rational. The intellectual and social ferment in the 18th century produced feminism. It arose as a middle-class movement demanding a re-examination of the theories of citizenship and natural rights. The French Revolution promised a free and equal society, but left women out. The revolution, though libertarian in most respects, was conservative on the gender issue. Most men continued to see the home as the rightful place for women. Just as the failure of early liberalism to fulfill its own promise led to the rise of Marxism, similarly it was silence on the part of natural rights theorists on the status, role and position of women that gave rise to feminism. This neglect prompted Olympe de Gouges, 1748-1793, in France to proclaim a manifesto of her own entitled The Proclamation of the Rights of Women and Female Citizens. In England, Wollstonecraft brought out her vindication of the rights of women, 1792. The early feminists were inspired by Locke's writings. The only mainstream male philosopher to espouse the cause of women, pleading for the need to reorder the private sphere on the same lines as freedom, equality, justice, self-worth and dignity that govern the public sphere, was J.S. Mill. He not only rejected patriarchy, but also insisted that liberal principles apply to women, family and the home. He combined his academic concern with political activism when he campaigned for women's suffrage in 1865, regarding it as the most important public service. Many socialists like Claude Henry Comte de Rouvroy Saint Simon, 1760-1825, Francois Marie Charles Fourier, 1770-1837, Friedrich Engels, 1820-1895, and August Bebel, 1840-1913, also wrote on the gender question, linking women's emancipation with the overall liberation of society. The feminists during the first wave pleaded for equal rights and opportunities for women, while the second wave, beginning in the last quarter of the 20th century, desired restructuring of society. There was a realization that the earlier demand for redistribution of resources and rights did not bring about substantive equality. Feminists brought out the limitations of mainstream Western political tradition, namely its male-centeredness. In spite of their confessions and attempts to offer universalistic prescriptions, most of the classics exhibit a gender bias and prejudice. The initial focus was to inquire the reasons for the exclusion of women from the political process. Subsequently, they resurrected texts, articles and writings to formulate a feminist political theory. Eurocentricism. Furthermore, some of the great masters were also Eurocentric, dismissing non-Western civilizations as unchanging and unhistorical. Along with Greece, the first philosophical worldviews emerged simultaneously in two other centers, India and China both in the 6th century BC. Both of them developed their own distinct and individualistic styles of philosophy. We have evidence that the art of writing was invented in Egypt in 4000 BC, and subsequently in Mesopotamia. Writing here took the form of pictures. Soon these pictures were conventionalized, and words were represented in the form of ideograms, as they still are in China. It took thousands of years for the development of alphabetical writing. The earliest civilizations were along the fertile regions of the Nile, Tigris and Euphrates. Here agriculture was the mainstay of the people. Egypt had a highly evolved system of tax administration, with a standardized system of revenue collection and drastic penalties for extortion and bribery on the part of tax collectors. The legal court admonished its officials to be patient, impartial and just. The Mesopotamian Empire, in spite of the theocratic pretensions of the royalty, had governments that had earthly concerns. The Code of Hammurabi, 1792-1750 BC, was a social product containing generations of political experience, thought and usage, with strict penalties for giving false witness, committing theft, and being unjust in marital relationships. The Code embodied a conception of civil justice. For the Hebrews, the monarch was both an agent of God and a symbol of the people, implying that besides divine sanction the monarch needed the support of his people. Hebrew thinkers repudiated the idea that priestly and kingly functions could be exercised by the same person. The reason for this separation was that the priest could check and criticize the king, if necessary. The Hebrews did not have a systematic and well-formulated theory of politics. Their thought mostly centered on religion. 
they were also convinced that divinity permeated all aspects of social and political life. This impeded the development of particular sciences. On the other hand, the interrelationship between religion and divinity prevented the Hebrews from developing an otherworldly approach to politics that characterized some interpretations of Plato and many versions of Christianity, Sibley 1981, 29. Chinese political thought was rich and diverse. The first tracts were associated with the Chu dynasty, and these consisted of poems, historical and court records, cryptic and elusive sayings, with lengthy commentaries. Of particular significance was the Mandate of Heaven, which stated that the ruling house could govern the empire, provided its rule was virtuous and beneficent, which it would lose if it became corrupt or inflicted disasters on its people. The other equally significant concern was the impeccable moral behavior of some early sage rulers, one of whom bypassed his own son and selected a commoner, for the latter's virtue was better than his son's. Confucius Kung Fu Su, 551-479 BC, can be regarded as the first political thinker, whose views were contained in the Analects. He held a minor office in his native state and led a modest life. He was a scholar and teacher, though later accounts described him as a great official and one who possessed supernatural powers. His ideal was a rule by moral example rather than military superiority or hereditary succession. The ruler and his officials and advisors were to be virtuous and meritorious. He did not distinguish between political and familial authority, regarding society as an extension of the ruler's household and a well-ordered family as the foundation of the state. He advocated self-control and duty towards others. He accepted social hierarchy and the division between the peasant and the literate, though he held that learning made human improvement possible. He taught that human beings should be in harmony with nature, through nature and government. Government was not a divine institution but a product of human reason and sound virtue. Here his ideas were similar to those of Plato and Aristotle. Another Confucian philosopher, Mencius Mengsu, 372-289 BC, advanced the doctrine of nature, reason and virtue as the basic requirements of a state. He looked upon the original human heart as reflecting the cosmic order. The Chinese did not look upon political authority as supernatural and the emperor as divine. They justified and defended revolution. Mencius even declared that a ruler who departed from reason and virtue could be executed. A ruler was responsible for the quality of governance and was accountable to his subordinates. Throughout Chinese thought runs an ideal that a ruler must ensure the safety and prosperity of his people. A rival school of Confucianism was legalism, consisting of diverse elements but given a philosophical touch by Hafei Su, 280-233 BC. The earliest legalists were Shang Kiangti, 338 BC, and Shen Puhe, 400-337 BC. Shang Kiang desired to organize the state along military lines as an efficient instrument of war. Hereditary officers would be replaced and encouragement would be given to agriculture and handicrafts to counter idle consumption and merchant activity. In a Taoist sense, he instructed the ruler to be non-attached and strive to attain sagehood. Hafei Su preferred the state to be ruled by law rather than the will of a prince. Taoist political theory is the most difficult to elaborate. Its earliest exponent was Chang Su, stressing simplicity in human existence. Lao Su, middle of the 3rd century BC, agreed with Confucius about the principles of a government. He also insisted that calmness of the mind came from a lack of attachment to transient things in the world. In fact, he anticipated Rousseau when he held that human beings became corrupt with the passage of civilization. He glorified rural simplicity, whereby the old practices were followed and the clever, prevented from having a definite say. He also instructed the sage ruler to adopt a principle of non-interference, similar to the physiocrats in Adam Smith, 1723-1790, as the best way to secure happiness and prosperity. He held that more laws and regulations would only encourage thieves, for corruption increased with governmental control. Mosu, 479-390 BC, a rival and a critic of Confucius, held that every policy of the state should promote the needs of the common people and not waste resources on elaborate ceremonies and rites. Confucianism and its variants remained the dominant philosophical tradition in China. Many elements of Confucianism were retained in Mao Zedong's 1893-1976 Marxism. In recent years the Confucian value system has been regarded as being responsible for the stupendous success of the East and Southeast Asian countries. A leading exponent of the Asian value system is the former Prime Minister presently a senior minister in Singapore, Lee Kuma Yu, who attributed rapid industrialization, economic growth and high levels of productivity without dislocating the family and traditional values to Confucianism. In fact, Confucianism has been seen as communitarian, in contrast to the individualism of the Western tradition. The Asian way is projected as a distinct alternative route to modernity. Huntington, 1993, concedes that Confucianism is the most profound challenge to the hegemony of Western ideology, and that cultural differences not only exist but could also ignite clashes between civilizations. Huntington ignores the fact that the growth of human ideas and institutions is a result of cooperation of all civilizations, a point lucidly narrated by Durant. 
Doctrines like clash of civilizations or Eurocentricism, and in recent times a refined version of Sade's Orientalism, are particularistic challenges to mainstream political theory which is based on Grotius principle of universality and a minimum everywhere. The contention of the Asian values school that the Western tradition is wholly individualistic is not right. No tradition is wholly individualistic or wholly communitarian. Most of them contain a happy mix of libertarian individualism, with concern for social commitment and common good. While cultural plurality is to be respected, it should not be particularistic so as to become divisive. In fact, we have a universal responsibility to use a single standard in judging human misfortune and injustice wherever they may occur. Sakharov 1989, Preface A typical example of the Western assessment of Indian political thought is provided by Dunning, 1902, who concluded that India did not have any political thought because of the dominance of religion and theology. Dunning, quoting Spender, mentions Egyptian and Chinese political thought, but omits India. This is a very prejudiced view. In fact, the tradition of Indian political speculation is very old, dating back to the Vedic period, 1500-1000 BC. In the 12th century, Kalhans Rajtarangini provided some very interesting insights into politics. Furthermore, the Upanishads, the Dharmasutras, the Buddhist texts, the Arthasastra, Manusmriti and the Santipurva of the Mahabharat provide a rich cluster of political ideas. Unlike the wide variety of political ideas that ancient Greece provided, ancient Indian political theory follows the pattern beginning with the Vedas, except for the Buddhist tradition. The primary reason for this was the fact that though some states were oligarchical and republican, by and large most of them were monarchies. Two other crucial factors impeded the development of political theory. One was the sway of religion, and the second was the Brahmin domination, with strict division of society into four distinct castes, each performing distinct functions. Even with Kautilya 321-296 BC, with his elaborate and skillful dissection of public administration and statecraft, there was an overall acceptance of the social order. This explains that the Saptanga theory, though more elaborate than a similar theory in the Western tradition, needed divine sanction to buttress political authority. This led to a basic imperfection in theorizing, as divine laws were unchangeable and society was strictly divided into four groups with separate functions and duties. Added to this was the factor of domination by Brahmins, the most privileged group, with exemption from taxation and punishment, constituting a state within the state. Like the Chinese, ancient Indians also believed that a ruler's first duty was to protect his people and their social needs. The ruler was subject to constitutional checks and could be questioned by his advisors and people. A just state was one that was based on dharma, an all-embracing term covering justice, duty and virtue. From the 8th century onwards, the period of Islamic thought begins. With the predominance of an Islamic religious code, civil law was a part of religious law. Non-Muslims were not considered full members of society. In the 15th century, new ideas started emerging under the enlightened reign of Akbar, who tried to reform and bring about equality irrespective of individual religious beliefs. Jahangir and Shah Jahan followed the tradition of Akbar, which was totally reversed by Aurangzeb, who reverted to religious orthodoxy. In the 18th century, the impact of European civilization was felt. This was of great significance, because after a century of anarchy and stagnation it created awareness in the minds of educated Indians. This was because not only Aurangzeb but even the Marathas, who arose in protest against Aurangzeb, were not receptive to new ideas. The failure of the Marathas was due to their inability to innovate, Sarkar 1973. Modern Indian political thought begins with Raja Ramohun Roy, 1774-1833. A distinctive aspect of political theorizing in the non-Western world has been that this exercise has been carried on by activist theoreticians like Gandhi, Mao and Roy. Conclusion Since the 70s, there has been resurgence in political theory, largely due to the efforts of Habermas, Nozick and Rawls. The themes that figure prominently since its revival are broadly social justice and welfare rights theory within a deontological perspective, utilitarianism, democratic theory and pluralism, feminism, postmodernism, new social movements and civil society, and the liberalism communitarian debate. Marion Young 1996, 481 to 500, Glazer 1995, 23. In fact, communitarianism fills the void left by the declining popularity of Marxism. Barry 1995, 24 to 29. This unprecedented lease of life that political theory has received is restricted to the universities and the academia and as a result it is a kind of alienated politics, an enterprise carried on at some distance from the activities to which it refers, Walzer 1989, 337. This resurgence also suggests that earlier pronouncements about its decline and or demise were premature and academically short-sighted. This newfound enthusiasm has been confined to liberal political discourse mainly due to the seminal work of Rawls, which fulfilled Germano's wish for a need to strengthen the open society. Recent liberal theory in its revived sense focuses on the idea of impartiality and fairness, in the belief that discrimination must be grounded on relevant differences, Ben and Peters 1959, 133. It is no coincidence that a well-formulated and detailed analysis of the concept of justice, long overdue since the time of Plato, emerges in roles, for whom justice meant fairness.
Rawls attempts to furnish an answer to how a just society should distribute liberties, opportunities, income, wealth and basis of self-respect. Among the competing ideologies which ushered in the 20th century, only liberal democracy, unlike fascism and communism, permitted free exchange of ideas, synchronized and adapted, if necessary, theory in the light of practice and identified the elements that constituted a just political and social order, without being doctrinaire and dogmatic. However, much of this new, liberal political theory is in the nature of refining and clarifying the earlier theoretical postures. Moreover, the loss of challenge by both fascism and communism, the first because of its defeat in the Second World War, and the second, which collapsed due to its own internal contradictions, also prove that utopian and radical schemes are no longer theoretically and practically desirable and feasible alternatives. This is true even of postmodernism and deconstructionism, which are suspicious of the dominant discourse and build their formulations with references to differences. But the essential formulations of Jacques Derrida, 1932-2004, and Michael Foucault, 1926-1984, provide new interpretations and meanings to old readings. They question the universalism and generalizations of Western theory and the Platonic Kantian idea of good. They reject the possibility of the realization of the perfect set of laws, which would always lead to domination and in freedom of some who constitute the other. However, postmodernism is also only a critique without much prospect of providing a viable alternative. Its impact has been more pronounced in literature than in the social sciences and political theory. Another contemporary concern is multiculturalism. Charles Taylor, 1931, justifies cultural recognition beyond rights of association, speech and tolerance, for culture is a way of life. He pleads for the preservation of indigenous culture mainly in the context of the French in Quebec. But commentators like Richard Rotti, 1931-2007, point out the dangers of cultural essentialism, as even when individual rights are preserved, emphasis on culture can be both coercive and oppressive. The implicit cultural essentialism of a good deal of celebratory multiculturalism disguises the powerful intracultural politics of determining the right of authoritative description, Rotti 1994, 158. Political theory since the time of Plato has responded to its time and place. Our own time and that of the future are no different. A variety of political theories would flourish, depending on the political agenda of a particular time and place. But our age differs from the ones that preceded it. It is an age of technology, manifest in the microchip revolution and satellite networks. With nation-states becoming more porous and receptive to outside influences, political theory too must respond to the increasing globalization and role of technology. The nature of this change has been summarized by a Swiss economist, William Rippard, 1955, who some years ago listed the four reasons for America's and parallel prosperity, something that applies to others as well, mass production, a passion for productivity, the spirit of competition, and the application of science to everyday economic needs. This exercise by Rappard, both in method and assessment, is similar to that of Polybius 203-120 BC, a Greek prisoner in Rome, who could discern and state the reasons for the dominance and superiority of Rome against Greece. Lord John Maynard Keynes 1883-1946, graphically underlined the importance that ideas exert, and if they have to continue to be influential and remembered by posterity, this is only possible if they deal with the complexities of our time within the parameters set by the great masters of political theory. Any serious and worthwhile political theory would have to shed its intellectual complacency and maintain the rigor of the discipline that one finds in the classics. As aptly remarked by Sartori, knowledge grows, in the alia, by acknowledging error. But political science hardly adheres to this rule. Over the decades the profession has shown little taste for self-criticism. Our self-perception tends to be that we are always progressing, if only sluggishly and non-linearly. But are we?